Hey, everybody. Welcome to the studio. You all look so bright and shiny and, sorry, not shiny. You look like perfect and uh, ready and awake and learning some embroidery today is definitely going to happen. So if you want to comfortably turn yourselves so you can see myself and our wonderful instructors, um, we're going to get started. So first I'm going to have uh, our director introduce themselves. Hi. Um, my name's Nicka Ross. I just wanted you to have a face to know that I'm the director here at the Studio for Creative Inquiry. So if this is your first time, I want to see your face again, too. Um, but Harrison's going to introduce you to the studio, tell you how to find our email uh, sign-up sheet and all of that. But um, I'm just really excited to have you all here. I'll be in and out throughout the day, and that's my dog, and I'm sorry already. <laughs> Um, but, <laughs> but if she bothers you, please just tell me. I'm going to put her on leash once we get started, so she won't be up in your threads. But thanks. Thank you, Nika. All right, so welcome to the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry. My name is Harrison Apple. I'm our associate director. I work here with Nika Ross, Linda Hager, Bill Rogers, who is our tech wizard and is here if we have issues, as well as Carol Hernandez and our student videographer, Olivia Connolly. Uh, the, please raise your hand if this is your first time visiting the studio for Creative Inquiry. Oh, good. This is great. Yeah, almost half the people here. So welcome. Um, drop in any time. You know, we're open 9 to 5. We have a ton of public programming, but it, we also have the most outlets in the entirety of CFA, so we're very popular for that. We have great Wi-Fi reception, just got new access points, and tastefully painted to make them look a little invisible. <laughs> uh, for our safety, I'd like to also point you out that the exit, uh, the emergency exit of best use is the one that you entered through, so front door right behind you. We also have a second one here, but I promise you that is the one you want to use. If you need to use the restroom, there is a gentle neutral restroom directly above us. You just go up the stairs and it's dead ahead. There is also a, um, there are binary gendered restrooms on the A level and first floor of the CFA. Um, to situate just uh, this gathering, we are on the traditional lands of many people, including the Adena, Hopewell, Monongahela, Haudenosaunee, um, and uh, many people whose relationships with the land continues to this day. The studio itself was founded in 1989, um, at the time being called the Carnegie Mellon University Center for Art and Technology. In fact, if you end up yourself back towards our first exit, you'll see the original sign. Um, we were located in what was then the uh, College of Fine Arts Library. When Carnegie Tech started, every college had its own independent library. This was for the College of Fine Art. All of these cabinets around you that now hold our equipment and library of lending materials were the art stacks for oversized color plates. And um, in our contemporary moment, the studio for Creative Inquiry is a venue, it's a classroom, it's a commons, and it's a laboratory for atypical, transdisciplinary, and interinstitutional research at the intersections of arts, science, technology, and culture. And core to the studio's mission are the student, staff, and faculty, and invited scholars that find support and inspiration in our space. Um, I want to also mention that you can find all of our events on the studio website, which is studioforcreativeinquiry.org. You can follow our Instagram for regular, silly, and serious updates about people who are visiting and programs you can attend, such as this one, although y'all filled this up so quickly we never had to promote it, so thank you for that. The, um, uh, some things that are coming up really soon, on March uh, 2nd, we have an opening lecture from our forthcoming visiting artist, Dorothy R. Santos, who's going to be here through the 17th, so I highly encourage you to come. That's going to be um, uh, the Thursday is March 2nd at 5.30 p.m., so you'll get to see them for a lecture. And if you've been to the studio before, then you know that every Steiner visiting lecture includes a bevy of dumplings. So please come for the food, stay for the art. Uh, and there will be a uh, workshop with Dorothy on March 11th, as well as a a lunch, excuse me, following immediately the day after the lecture. So lots of chances to meet them while they're here. Um, if you're interested in documentary poetics, learning more about processing, which you'll we'll be using today, Dorothy is the executive director of Processing Foundation, Processing Org. So I hope to see you again. And that's enough for me. I want to introduce our uh, instructors who are here, uh, supported by our incredibly generous Sylvia and David Steiner speaker series. We have two studio alumni, former punks and current rock stars, uh, <laughs> David B. Perry and Tatiana Mustakos. Um, respectively living in Pittsburgh, working for Deep Local now, and um, in New York City as an artist and educator. Um, they are both uh, graduates from, uh, from CMU with uh, interdisciplinary degrees, focusing on soft technologies and art and interactivity, and they are two of the wizards that were using P Embroider a lot, among many other ways of computational embroidery while they were here. So I'm so happy that they've come back to share their skills with you, um, and I'm going to pass it off to them now. Yeah. 
Um, thank you all for having us. Do you want me to give the intro? Or? Uh, yeah, sure. um, so yeah, uh, thank you, Harrison, for that really wonderful intro. Um, so um, uh, yeah, um, this um, is uh, a workshop that we've been talking about uh, like literally for, for years um, and are really excited to finally kind of be in the space and be able to kind of, uh, kind of talk to you all about um, kind of uh, P embroider and also more generally uh, computational embroidery um, and computational fibers. Um, so the goal of today is um, first we're going to kind of talk you through kind of the tools and techniques of computational embroidery that me and Tatiana have used um, and that we can kind of really articulate this afternoon. We're going to have uh, two artist lectures, one from Leah Alba um, and the other from Hugh Messi. Um, uh, you can actually see some of their work. Uh, Hugh does a lot of embroidered animation um, and other kind of uh, experimental animation. And then Leah uh, actually works with Jim McGann um, and uh, works kind of at the intersection of, of fibers and technology a fair amount as well. Um, and then we will finally uh, get into a kind of a more hands-on section of the, the, the workshop um, and have y'all um, actually make some custom patches um, at end of day um, so that y'all can take something away. Um, I also, um, there are things around the room, there are machines, um, there, uh, there will be food, um, and then there is also um, a, a big table of samples in the back. Um, y'all can feel free to just kind of um, I actually always find that that's like the most exciting and kind of fun way to really interact with a lot of these materials. So feel free um, to really like go back there, touch them, play with them. Um, please try not to lose them because um, uh, there's like there's a lot um, and some of them are small. Um, so uh, if it if it can just go back where you found it um, once you're kind of done manipulating it and playing with it, that would be great. Um, so um, at that, um, you want to jump in? Cool. Um, so we have a tiny URL. If you can all open that, that's going to be our GitHub page. That's going to kind of act as our landing page. We have links to all. <laughs> Woof. We. <laughs> We have links to all the different slides that we're opening, so you can open them on your laptop and use them for reference. We have links in a lot of them. We also have links to all the code we're going to be going through, as well as links to external websites, so as well as the timeline. So that's just a good way to just keep on track with what we're doing and follow along in an easier way. Um, yeah, we're going to start off with what is a sewing machine? Do we have anything else? Um, no, I'm good. All right. I'm going to write the tiny URL on the whiteboard. OK. Um, OK, uh, while well, Tatiana does that, um, I'm going to just kind of jump in um, and start by kind of um, giving a little uh, talk about kind of the most fundamental um, kind of aspect of this, which is like, what is a sewing machine? Um, oop. Um, so, um, so the, we're, the tool, the, like the tool that we're using here is an embroidery machine, um, but kind of the most basic, um, kind of part of that, um, is a sewing machine. Um, this is a really wonderful video that I was introduced to by, actually, you know, um, sorry, I'm going to change to the podium really quick because I realized that I have audio there. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Sorry, there's there are technical aspects of this that that we're warming up to. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so the most basic kind of form of that. Um, Using two separate. So this is a really wonderful video that I was introduced to by um, okay, Olivia okay. Robinson. Um, it's called the, it's like a, from the. We haven't managed to make it stitch very machines. neatly. But even if the machine was properly set kind of up, chain stitch thing. still has a disadvantage that it's very easily pulled apart. Unknown to Thimonier, 
other inventors were experimenting with a different sort of stitch, lock stitch, using two separate reels of cotton. The machines were more complicated, but the stitches they produced were neater, and uh, they didn't pull apart so easily. The secret of these machines was really the brilliant shape of the needle itself. We've made a giant one here, and you can see the eyes in the pointed end of the needle, and it has a groove all the way up one side that the thread can slip through. Well, with a real needle, if I push it through a bit of uh, cotton, and pull it out again, it automatically leaves a loop underneath. And all the machine needs to form a stitch is to pass the second reel of cotton through the loop. The first lock stitch machine was built in America by an inventor called Walter Hunt in about 1833. It didn't work very well, so he lost interest and didn't even bother to patent it. Elias Howe patented an improved machine in 1845 and despite an initial lack of interest, this then acted as a catalyst to other American inventors. And within 10 years, all the major elements of a modern sewing machine had been introduced. I'm going to try and demonstrate these with this human sewing machine, stitching together two sheets of standard polystyrene. The, <laughs> the needle goes through the material. The bottom bobbin is pushed through the loop. The needle comes out and the stitch is pulled tight and the material is pulled forward. Every lock stitch machine has these four movements. Pushing through the needle, passing the loop round the bobbin, pulling the stitch tight and moving the material forward. The movements are all connected. So that's, again, I would recommend watching the whole thing. I know Olivia, I, I've seen it in many, many fibers classes and it's a really wonderful series. Um, but yeah, so it, it's pretty important to note um, that sewing machines, um, they're, a very, they're actually a, a kind of a wonderful mechanical device um, that uses, um, they, they create, um, they, they lock together fabric using um, two threads, um, a kind of a top thread and a bobbin thread. Um, and the top thread actually gets pulled around the bobbin whenever um, a stitch is formed. Um, and this is important uh, for any embroidery design um, and also um, to really differentiate, uh, there's a real difference between hand embroidery and machine embroidery. That's actually a, a kind of a key thing to note. Because um, like whenever you look up embroidery on Pinterest, um, it's a, a, there's a lot of hand embroidery there. Um, and it's important to note that there's like a difference in texture and form that you can, that you can get with machine embroidery. Um, and then, um, so uh, kind of getting into a little bit more of the technicality of what is an embroidery machine. So an embroidery machine, um, uh, in essence, it, it holds and fixtures fabric underneath the needle and moves it on the XY underneath the, edel, the needle to actually create an image or design um, during, during stitching. Um, and um, for those in the room that um, are kind of familiar with the, the realm of plotters, um, uh, the, um, uh, an embroidery machine, in essence, uses kind of a, a plotter mechanism, in essence, attached to a sewing machine um, to actually create, uh, to, uh, to, to move the fabric. Um, and to me, this feels kind of important to note um, because this can kind of connect us with the world of kind of generative um, art that we see kind of in, in, in uh, plotters. Um, there's a kind of a rich, um, there's a, a rich world of, um, of uh, kind of generative art um, uh, made for, for plotters. Um, and actually one of this, this device that you see over here um, is actually we have, uh, it is used by the uh, drawing with machines class. Um, it's actually called an axi draw. Um, and it holds a pen and, and, and draws on a page. Um, and we actually have one in the back of the room here. Um, and then I also kind of wanted to note um, kind of the world of I industrial embroidery machines, um, one of which we actually have at the front of the, um, the, the room, which was uh, very kindly offered um, for this workshop by the, the costumes department. Um, and um, industrial sewing machines, whereas um, kind of domestic, domestic embroidery machines um, have a single uh, needle and single thread. Um, so you can only, in essence, do one color at a time. 
um, uh, industrial embroidery machines. Um, they actually uh, have multiple needles pre-threaded with multiple colors so you can more efficiently stitch designs. Because multiple colors, handling multiple colors is kind of a big thing in embroidery. I also like to kind of note, um, if you're looking at a more efficient kind of world of kind of color management, this is actually a device called a color reel. It actually dyes thread um, as it goes into the machine. Um, so you can in essence have a continuous, uh, continuous stitch run. Um, and also a wider, wider variance of color. Um, I have actually seen one of these. Um, I was doing a, a tour of um, an embroidery studio in New York, um, and they had one of these. They actually had to set up a little humidifier by the machine because it's very finicky. Um, so they are, they're very cool, but they're also finicky and, and hard to work with. Um, and then DIY embroidery machines. Um, this was actually how I got into embroidery. I was taking a mechatronics class over in uh, the, the engineering school. Um, and um, for that project, I decided to build a device that would convert a standard sewing machine into an embroidery machine. Um, and there's a lot of precedent for this. There's actually a lot of examples that you can find online of people, um, in essence, making, again, like a plotter type device with um, a needle sent and integrating it with a needle sensor so that you can create what is in essence an embroidery machine just using a standard sewing machine. Um, and this can also be interesting because you can, you can kind of hack it and make it do things that standard embroidery machines do not. Um, and I also, I kind of wanted to give a little bit more wordage just to the difference between machine and hand embroidery. Um, in hand embroidery, you can really, you can do everything from, you can in essence do like weaving on top of fabric, you can create knots, you can catch loops. Um, there's a lot of just like, there's a lot of stitches um, in hand embroidery that are really wonderful and really beautiful that are a little bit hard to capture or that are, that are impossible um, to actually do with a machine. Um, but I, during this workshop, we might actually use um, some hand embroidery methods as reference. Um, because I think um, actually some of the, the most exciting uh, techniques and examples I've kind of explored and discovered um, have actually come from trying to emulate hand embroidery techniques with a machine. Um, so I think there's a lot of really wonderful um, examples there, but there is, there is a very key difference between the two, the two worlds. Um, and, and that is, is um, kind of the world of machine embroidery. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it off to Tatiana. Um, do you want the podium? Okay. Um, you get to, cool, awesome. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> Hello, can everybody hear me? Okay, so I'm going to run through just what is P-Embroider and then I'm gonna make sure everybody has everything set up for using processing on your computer and then I'm gonna do two little demos which after I do those, David's gonna show you how to run them on the machine. All right, P-Embroider. So what is P-Embroider? P Embroider is an open source library for processing that allows you to create embroidery files for free. It was developed by Golan Levin, Ling Dong Huang, and myself, and it's intended for primarily artists, craftsperson, educators, makers, and school. And it allows you to create computational embroidery. We made it as a response to the high cost of embroidery software on the market, and also because there's not really an outlet for generative design and Embroidery and this kind of bridges the gap and allows you to make computational embroidery designs through code. It's an alternative to Inkstitch is another open source. We're not the only open source. Um, Inkstitch is based off Inkscape, which is a vector software similar to Illustrator. There's also commercial software, but those are pretty inaccessible. And if you just want to like experiment and learn what's going on without investing hundreds and thousands of dollars, you can't really do that with commercial software. There's also alternatives like Pi Embroider slash Embroider Pi which is open source and Python based, but it's less usability functions. So with uh, P Embroider, you can do things like circle and it makes a circle for you. And Embroider Pi is more focused on the needle downs specifically. Using P Embroider. Right. Uh, so this is the template file. And what it does is, it, this is a template file that you can use when you're doing your code later. 
Um, and we have a section for your code right here. And before that is just setting up the P embroider graphic, saving the file name, and then afterwards we have exporting, visualizing, and optimizing. I'm gonna go this in depth when I'm doing my demo in a couple minutes. Um, so keep in mind, scale 100 pixels is one centimeter. Uh, it always looks bigger on the screen and then you embroider it and it's a little tinier, but keep that in mind. We also have the ruler. This is the P embroider ruler example. Um, we have this, I think, on the table? Yeah, it's yeah. back on the table in the back. On the table in the back. So what does it let you do? So you can make shapes. Make shapes. Uh, these are a lot of different shapes that you can make. Um, and most of these are already like processing functions. So we have E dot circle makes a circle. Can you see my? Yeah. Okay. I was just checking if you can see my mouse. Um, then you have E dot square, E dot rectangle. You can also specify whether you want the corners to be rounded or if you like want just one corner to be rounded. You can make quads, four-sided shapes. You can make an ellipse, a triangle. You can make arcs, which you can be like a pi arc or a chord. And then you can make polygons with the begin shape function using either straight lines or curved lines. And you can also cut out of shapes. And that's the pinbreader shapes file. Um, all the images are going to have the example file underneath. You can also do fills. All right, so this is circles and squares. Um, we have parallel hatch, hatch mode parallel. You can see that the lines are running parallel to each other. The difference in these is the hatch angle. So here you have a 45 degree angle. With these, you have a 90. You can also specify that in radians or in angles, depending on what you set it to. You have a concentric hatch, so that's just drawing a lot of smaller circles. You can see it easier here. With a square, it's just one big square, a lot of tiny squares in the middle. And then you have the spiral, it's spiraling. And the difference between these two and these two is the hatch spacing on this is bigger than in that, and this one is bigger than in that. Different fills, Perlin fill. So this is a fill based on Perlin noise. Um, it's one of my favorites because it just looks really good. Um, there's also the cross fill. On these two, you can see there's two lines that are crossing each other, and you can set the angle of each of those lines specifically in the code. You can also make custom fills. So this is the example at the bottom of shape hatching, where we've defined a vector field based on the sine wave. And then you go in and you specify, like you get the needle downs for the points on that without having to rely on a built-in fill, you can customize it and build your own, which you can't really do in, like for example, Inkstitch or probably the software as well. You don't have that level of control that you do when you're coding it in P Embroider. Um, different fills. So these, this is the parallel fill. Uh, you can control the resampling offset factor. And what that does is it just, if you look at this first example, it's the same stitch length, but it's just like all in a row. So when you embroider it, you get these ridges. And then if you change it, so we have that, yeah, so the first example is the offset factor of one. So it's always consistent. If you change it to five, to 0.5, uh, you can see that each alternating line is staggered by 0.5. So it's moved over half. And here you can see fainter lines that are half the size, and then on this one, 0.3, it's doing the same thing, it's alternating. Every other line is like 0.3 off, and it gets a smoother fill. This is the same example, but a smaller stitch length, and this one is if you use E dot set stitch, which takes in the minimum stitch length, the desired stitch length, and then a noise function, so it kind of randomizes it, and you can see that it's less, that it's more random. Shape culling, so you can cull shapes as well, and what that means is you can subtract shapes from other shapes. So here we have two circles, and yeah, so that's hatch of, ah, whoops, sorry. Um, yeah, so you have on the top row, you have the circles are being rendered on top of each other, and it's stitching the, the full first circle and then the full second circle, but a lot of times if you're doing shapes that overlap, you don't want to see the shape that's under the topmost shape. So you can call it, which just you call both circles. You call begin call, and then you draw the circle, and then you draw the other circle, and it basically removes the overlapping section. 
more fills. We have the satin fill, which is the prettiest fill because it hides all the like behind the scenes lines. You can see all these paths that it has to take, but in the satin fill, that's hidden. Strokes, different strokes. So you have perpendicular or tangent are the different uh, stroke modes that we have. Tangent going the same like direction as the shape and then perpendicular going perpendicular to the stroke that we have. Um, and then you can change the stroke weight. So this is, a that's a tangent stroke. This one is tangent, this one is perpendicular. You can see that it's going in the opposite direction of the full shape we have. And as it's going up, the stroke weight is increasing. As it's going down on this side, the stroke weight is increasing. And on this one, the stitch length is larger at the bottom. So this is just one needle down here and one needle down here, whereas if you go to the top, you have a lot of tiny little needle downs in the middle. You can also control the stroke cap to be round or square. You can see the difference. This is the square one. Um, it just cuts off at the bottom, and then here it's more round. You can also control the stroke spacing. You can see the difference on this is being more, um, or this one is less, no, this one's more dense, and this is more sparse. So the spacing on this one is a higher number. Same with this. This stroke spacing is higher than this one. Th this one's higher than that one. This one's higher than this one. It just controls like the distance between the lines. Outlines. This will be good for patches if you're doing some complex shapes. Um, you can set the stroke location to be inside the shape that you're outlining in the middle or completely outside of it. Um, and to do that, if you want to do a composite, you just begin composite and then you would draw like circle, triangle, square, and composite and that would render it as like one shape. Other stuff. You can render PNGs and GIFs. It intakes a white on black as the input. You can see here I have this image of a broken heart and it is doing cross fill, hatch fill, the parallel fill, concentric fill, a really dense concentric fill. This one was an experimental fill. Uh, don't try to embroider that. <laughs> um, and then this is, you also can grab the outline from it. This is the perpendicular outline and this is the tangent outline. And to do that, you just upload your image, which you're going to have in the folder. Um, you can see that in the example for this has the image in there. And then when you draw the image, you just call it e.image, my image, and then your coordinates. Um, you can also use that to make multicolor designs. So I have this drawing here, and I broke it up into one PNG per color, green, brown, and you just upload, you draw all of those images individually, declare them, and then draw them. And you can change the fill between them as well. You can also do that with SVGs. You can render closed shapes. And it's the same thing, um, load shape, or yeah, that's a different code because it's an SVG, but that's in the example, that's in the example of PMbroider SVG image. And this is showing all the different fills on the duck shape as well as an outline. Um, what you can do with PNGs, you can also do frame-by-frame frame animation. You can do that without PNGs as well. You could do that computationally. This is an example of the MyBridge horse running animation. And what we did was we embroidered all the different frames, and then we scanned it and composited it into a GIF. And you can see the difference of the original, the bitmap, and the embroidered. You can also do text. So E text A is going to show up as this. You can set the text size. You can set the outline and the fill. You can set the render order of stroke over fill or fill over stroke. This is just stroke. This is stroke over fill. This is fill over stroke. And this is just fill. And fill is referred to as hatch when you're choosing like hatch mode. Uh, there's also different fonts. You have different plain fonts, like single lines. You have simplex, duplex, complex. You got some script and some gothic. The fonts are generally easier to do a little bigger just because you have to trim all the edges. More drawing. <laughs> so you can freehand draw on two of the different examples. Um, we have P Embroider Interactive Demo 2 is a simple just click and draw. 
And then we have a more complex P embroider editor that Ling Dong coded where you can have layers, you can change the colors, you can do a lot of fancy stuff. Things to keep in mind. So different brands use different files. Today we're only using Brother Machines and Husqvarna Machines. Husqvarna takes VB3 and Brother takes PEZ. Um, but you can also export PDFs, SVGs, TSVs, G-code, and CNC for the AxiDraw. Um, and then the other embroidery files that it exports are up here. And previewing files. So P-Embroider does not act as a file viewer and you cannot import pre-existing embroidery files into it. You can just generate them. Um, there's some free software out there. Premiere Plus is one that is, that's a paid software for creating embroidery, but they have a free viewer. And my editor is a different one. Um, you can also preview on the machine. What I like to do is I like to export screenshots. So every example basically that I've showed you, this is me just exporting a PNG of my frame at the same time that I'm exporting the file. And that way you just have both images in the same folder and you can kind of, if you can't see one, you can just click on the PNG with the same name and then you can see what's going on. Yeah. Um, so now I'm going to do a... Yes, you may. <laughs> we have some additional notes. Um, yeah, I also, I, I, I feel like we should have, um, so PMBroider is a really exciting tool, but it's also still kind of an experimental tool. Um, so whenever you're stitching anything that's coming out of PMBroider, it's good to kind of like watch the machine closely and also kind of listen to it. Um, just because um, sometimes it will create fills that are a little too tight. There's a lot of, um, it, the actual default uh, stitch length is a little tight. It's, I think it's like almost half a millimeter. Yeah. Um, which is a little bit close together. Um, and again, some of the fills, you can end up accidentally like breaking a needle pretty, pretty easily um, if, uh, if you just um, it, with certain fills. So um, it's just uh, good to kind of like check your, check your work um, and also just really kind of like look at the output to make sure you're not having too many overlapping stitches. Yeah, the um, when I showed the PNG embroider and I was like, don't stitch that broken heart that was really dense. That's because it will just like tear your fabric and it's just really, really dense um, and doesn't work. <laughs> but that was an experimental fill. Um, so experiments are for learning. All right, um, I think Harrison checked earlier, does everybody have processing and P embroider running, working, everything's going good? Did anybody have any trouble with that? You can raise your hand and we can help you out. All right, beautiful, <laughs> A plus. All right, so now I'm gonna do a demo of basic shapes using the template file and one of the freehand draw and then, um, yeah, and then David's gonna embroider those on the brother that is up here. So this is the template. Um, it should be linked. If you want to open that, you can. I'm gonna give you a walkthrough of it. Uh, line one imports P embroider so that you have P embroider, which is what we're using, so you need that. Uh, e declares the P embroider graphic that we're gonna be writing onto. Excuse me. Uh, size 700 by 700. That's making the canvas again. 100 pixels is one centimeter, so this is seven centimeters by seven centimeters. Here you're initializing the P embroider graphic as this, and then giving it the width and the height of the canvas. String output file path. This is the name of the file you'll be outputting. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to change this to PEZ because that's what the brother takes in. And I'm going to call this example demo. This file is linked um, here. And then, yeah, and then here is just taking that string that we just made and setting that as the path for the outputted file. And then you have starting the draw with begin draw and clear. Um, just make sure there's nothing on the canvas. Your code is going to go in this section and then file and saving and preview. I'm going to show you more about these as I'm coding because it makes more sense to visualize when you have code to visualize. 
Um, but optimize optimizes the file paths. You also see that a little better with the visualization. And draw writes out the file name and then save. This is what I use to export that PNG that I can like then see what I have without using the embroidery software. All right, so I'm going to start with a rectangle. And to do that, I'm just going to type in e.rect. I'm going to put it at 50, 50, and then 100 by 300. Actually, before I do that, this is what just the template looks like. There's nothing. It's just 700 pixels by 700 pixels. And now when I put the rectangle in, this is run with the default settings, which is no fill and just a stroke that's a single line. I'm also going to put in a circle, so E dot circle, and I'm going to put that at 350, 350, just in the middle of the canvas. You could also write in like width divided by two, height divided by two if you want to get in the center. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you got to put the semicolon at the end. Um, it will tell you to do that if you don't, or it just won't run. Um, so here we go. Now I have the circle and the rectangle, and if I don't have the semicolon, it's like, ah, oh, where's your semicolon? <laughs> So I'm going to make it so that I have one rectangle, which is going to be only a stroke, and then the circle is just going to be a fill. If I t go in and here, I'm going to type in e dot stroke weight. I'm going to set that to 10. That way it is thicker, and you can see that. Oh. Huh? Let me try. Um, yeah, there is. Good news. Is that good? I can make it bigger. Is that good? Yes, yes, yes. I'll also, I'll be uploading this file into the thing um, if you fall behind, but I can go slower, yes. Um, can every, can, is there anybody who cannot read this font size? Do I need to make it bigger? All right. What? Well, I need both. Yeah, okay, so I made the stroke weight bigger and you can see that applied to everything after that. Um, but if I had put it like here, then it's not gonna do the rectangle, it's just gonna do the circle. Um, so I'm putting that back and then I'm gonna change the color of the stroke. So E dot stroke is how you change the color. Zero, two, five, five, zero. I'm going to make that green. Yes. Okay, yeah. So the only thing in this section that you should be changing is just this little bit right here. And then you're going to look at your table and see if you have like a brother or a Husqvarna. If you have a brother, you're going to change that to Pez. If you have a Husqvarna, it's a VP3. And then aside from that, you should just be writing your code in here. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Okay, yeah. So I'm gonna, yeah, so that's um, visualize, which I will jump into right now. Um, so the, in if you look at visualize, e.visualize, uh, this is the default setting, uh, which it actually has some hidden parameters. The default is the same as typing false, true, false. So if I run this, it's going to look the same. But if I go in and I put the last one to true, it's going to show me the connecting lines between the shapes. So this is all the stitches that it's going to output, not just the shapes that I want it to. And then if I go change the first one to true, that's going to show my color. So that's how you can visualize the color. If you want to change this one to false, the middle one, what it does is it shows the needle downs. Um, but I feel like those are, those are helpful, so I'm going to leave them on. I'm going to put it on all true so that you can see everything we're doing. Um, I think I saw a hand. 
the three inputs are color, needle downs, and connecting lines. So if I turn this off, it goes back to just being the gray. And then if I turn this off, we don't get that red line that's connecting the circle and the rectangle. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, sorry. Uh, I think David mentioned them earlier. The needle down is just the point where the needle goes down into the fabric and then comes back up. So that's going to be everywhere that the needle goes down and then the thread locks together and it comes back up. Yes. Which pink? Oh, so the um, I changed it to green. Um, so what? Why it's green here is just because um, if I like go in and I type in stroke zero zero two five five, that's just a way to visualize my design a little better instead of it being monochrome. So here you can see like the different shapes in the different colors that they are instead of all of it just being like the thread being the same color. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then it was pink earlier. That's just the needle drowns are rendered in magenta and then the connecting lines are rendered in red. Can you can ask as many questions as you want. What is the oh my God, sorry. Yes, so that is red, green, blue. Um, so the way that processing takes in color is as an RGB value. Um, so the, if I have this set to 255, that's going to show up as red. It looks pink because the needle downs are pink, but that's red. <laughs> um, if I set it to 255, 255, 255, that's going to be white because that's the max of all the colors. If you want uh, purple, that's going to be like 2550, 255. Yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah, uh, with the zero being none of that color and two, five, five being the most of that color. Yes. No, you can do, um, like, if you want to go to, let me open a little. I think if you go to, like, Google and find, like, RGB color picker. You can pick like whatever you want and just steal the value from here. Um, but so when you're running the file on the machine, it's just going to be like change the color and it doesn't actually matter what the color is in there as long as you know what you're putting in. Because um, when it says, if it says like change color to red, like you can put in blue thread, it doesn't know. But if you want to, I use it to like visualize the design a little better. Um, whenever you change color, uh, this is actually where the machine is going to like stop and give you a chance to actually change, to actually switch threads. Um, so um, it, uh, it can also be a good way if you're doing like a multi-step or uh, kind of process, like in-hoop design, um, you can use the, uh, you can use the thread color, you can use the color to actually encode just where to stop the machine um, and kind of how to break down the design. All right, and now I'm gonna, yes. Yeah. When you optimize and you have different thread colors, will it automatically separate the... So it, it optimizes by chunk. Like if I have red, blue, red again, it's not gonna optimize both reds together because sometimes you have like overlapping shapes like in the, um, let me open the, I should not have closed that file. Um, Uh, if I go to the text example, this example that's loading is the A's. Um, and this, this one takes a little longer to embroider because 
you can't embroider all the red at once and then all the pink because some of the red is on top of the pink and some of the pink is on top of the red. Does that make sense? So in the optimization, it it can't optimize all the colors together because there is the possibility of it overlapping. Um, but as I, as I do the fills, I'll show you uh, the optimization function a little better. Because um, right now there's not really anything to optimize. <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna change the stroke mode to tangent because I prefer the look of what? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't see the hand. <laughs> So the default was just that single line. Um, let me type this in so that my code runs. Yeah, so the default, which is uh, when I just made the circle and the square, or the circle, yeah, the, the circle and the rectangle, the default is just one. So it's just one little line, and there's no thickness to it. Um, but now if I make it bigger, it's got some heft. Yeah, so when you run this, it's gonna apply to everything below it. If I want the circle to be one, then I would put that right above the circle after I've rendered the rectangle. Just like that. And then I'm actually going to turn off the stroke for the circle, but first I'm going to add a fill. So I'm going to do e.fill of green. So you can see now that I have a fill, uh, and the fill is... So the word fill in processing is telling you what color the fill is, but then for P embroider, we're using the word hatch to indicate more information about that fill of the shape. So if I change hatch mode is what I'm going to be changing instead of fill mode. Yes. Um, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> for the colors, oh, for the colors. Um, so the window should show up when you press run, but um, before I jump into that, there's also linked in the, there's a cheat sheet. So this cheat sheet is really helpful because it shows you all the functions. So if you don't know like what the hatch modes are, you can go here and it like just has them all listed out for you. Um, that is linked in. Tiny URL. <laughs> Com emb23. Um, if I go to here, this is the P embroider cheat sheet. And I'll just give you a quick walkthrough for this. Um, yeah, so this is just an overview. The different shapes, circle, rectangle, triangle, line. How to composite different fills. You have the ones that we have are concentric, parallel, satin, spiral, purlin, and cross. Hatch settings, you have the hatch spacing. You have the hatch angle, you have the fill. The fill is the color. You also have stroke, stroke weight, stroke spacing. These are all in the examples in the PowerPoint. So if you open up the PowerPoint, you can have like the visual for these. The stroke location, center, inside, outside. The stroke order. And then a little info on the text. And then it just shows you how to like import images. So this just runs you through the stuff that you want to do if you're like, ah, how do I do that? Go to the cheat sheet or to the PowerPoint. D does anybody else have a question? I'm, I'm so Let me see. Um, so now that I set the fill for the circle, I'm going to go in and I'm going to change that to a Perlin fill. So to do that, you type in e dot hatch mode, and then in there e dot perlin, and for the constants, which are the def definitions of the strokes and the hatches, that needs to be in all caps. Otherwise, it's not going to compile. So here you can see 
the optimize function has not been run, so that looks wild. <laughs> And that would take a long time to embroider. It's just going wherever. If I turn optimize on, it cleaned up the lines a lot. So now instead of having all those lines going everywhere on the circle, you only have like 10 or 20 small little red lines connecting all the fills, all of the hatch lines. And if you're running pretty complex code, uh, this example is pretty simple, so it compiles easy, but you can do like really complex stuff. You probably want to turn off optimize while you're doing that just so that it runs quicker because optimize for more complex stuff can take like a couple minutes sometimes to render out. Um, and then if you're doing that, you would probably just turn the visualize for them off so you can see your design without optimizing it. I'm going to turn the stroke off for my circle. And to do that, I'm just going to type in e dot no stroke. Does anybody have any questions? All right. <coughs> All right. So now I have this circle that does not have a fill, or it does not have it does have a fill. It does not have a stroke. And then I'm going to change my file name to be the same as. as the file that I'm exporting the embroidery file to. And then let me make sure I did everything I wanted to do. Yeah, so now if I want to export this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncomment and draw, and I'm going to uncomment save. You don't need to have save uncommented. Um, it'll still export a file. You just won't be able to like see it in the folder. And if I have this open and I run this, you can see that it just generated these two files. You have the image and then you have, this is the previewer from Premiere Plus, but if you don't have that, then you can just see it with this and you'll know what the file is. Um, and then I'm going to do the little drawing demo on the freehand. So freehand draw is also in the GitHub. So it's in the tiny URL GitHub. It's an example. So it's called freehand draw. If I run this, it's already set up. So you just go in there and you can draw whatever you want. This is. The second demo, so this is the link right here. If you open that, it is freehanddraw.pde. And this is uh, basically the code from PMBroider Interactive Demo 2 in the PMBroider re-examples folder. But I cleaned it up a little bit so that the lines were tangent. And it was a little just what I wanted to show. Um, but yeah, you can just copy this code, download it, open it. And it is already running. It's an interactive. Example, so when you run it, it is basically just a drawing program. You can click and you can draw on there. So you can make computational embroidery or you can use it as a tool to draw with. Um, so there's like a lot of different ways that you can use P Embroider to make embroideries. In this, yeah, so if I want to save this, I'm going to press S and let me navigate to there. So I have a, I forgot to save my um, PNG of that. But yeah, so this is, you can't um, open the files that you're exporting. So you can't open like a PEZ file in PMBroider or a VP3. But you can export them, and then, yeah, it just resets when you start it again. Um, so not for the freehand drawing example, because the freehand drawing, it's just taking in your 
mouse clicks and it's not storing that anywhere. Whereas if you had made it um, through code, it would. Uh, but one way that I've worked with this before is you can like, you can edit the code to make it do whatever you want. What I've done sometimes is like when I set up a key so that that saves the current stuff and then it clears everything and but also takes a screenshot. So then it renders that screenshot and then I can draw on top of that. And that kind of acts as not as it's not saving the information, but I have the picture of what I already have so that I can draw on top of it and add on to it. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna show you how to um, just get the code into a new file if you need to make a new processing f folder. You just open processing, you have this blank. Um, I have processing three installed, so it's like a different blue, but it acts the same, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's the same. Uh, we define E as P embroidered graphics, so you don't have to type the whole thing out. Um, so it's just a little easier to type in E, but it is, it's the same. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to put more work in and type the whole thing out, you can. Yes. Yeah, the examples show like sometimes different ways of doing the same thing. Um, so sometimes there are like multiple ways, but it, the output's the same. Um, yeah, so if you want to put like this code, for example, you can download it and open it by downloading the GitHub, or you can just copy and paste all of that and put it in there and then run it. And it's like, but then it's there. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit to play around with that. Um, and I'm going to just put the files that I exported onto a USB so that in a little bit we can show the demo on the machine. And then if you're putting it onto the machine, you just put your thumb drive in and this will pop up and then you can just drag your, I like to drag the PEZ and the PNG so I can, again, just so I can see it. And then you just drag it in there and it'll show up once you plug it in, um, which you'll see in the demo, but that's how you just get it on the USB. Yes. Yeah, so um, when I was showing like the stroke, if I get rid of no stroke, um, it basically, if you define your settings, it's gonna apply to everything below it unless you change it after that. So right now I have stroke weight 10 on line 20 and that applied to everything that ran after that. So it applied to the rectangle and it also applied to the circle even though I have like, the way I'm organizing my code is I have everything that I want the rectangle to be above the rectangle. Um, if I then want the circle to have like a different stroke, I'd have to go and put that in. So if I want, yeah, so it runs everything before it, um, unless you have, yeah, unless you change it. So. Right now, if I wanted circle to have a different stroke weight, I'd have to define that below the rectangle. Does that make sense? Um, so if you put, I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yeah. 
yeah so if you if you moved rectangle to are you saying like if you if you did that so if you did that then circle and rectangle would be rendered exactly the same yeah yeah so it only looks at like yeah 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 it looks yeah exactly does that answer your question and then if you put something like under all the rendering, it's just not going to do anything with that because you're not drawing anything after you define that. Um, if anybody wants me to demo anything again, I can show you a, like a specific function if anybody's confused about anything. Let me uh, get David on the mic for that. <laughs> He's used it a little more recently. Um, Cause yeah. Yeah, so that's in P-Embroider example, so it's in the P-Embroider GitHub. And then it's examples P-Embroider editor.
And then I just threw um, the completed embroidery into the GitHub if you want to access that. Just a few more notes for the freehand. Um, if you're saving, the key for that is S. That's what it's written in, in as the code. And then if you want to find your file, uh, if you're copy and pasting the code from the GitHub instead of downloading it, you want to make sure that you save your PDE file before you export so that you know where you can grab that from. The last thing I said was um, you have to save like your processing file. So if I have like a new one and I just type stuff in, I can run this, but it doesn't like, I don't know where that exists on my laptop. So if you save it beforehand, then you'll know what directory to go in to grab your exported files.
All right, um, we're gonna have a very special talk by Hugh Messi. Hugh Messi is a artist who works in computational embroidery, not using P-Embroider. Um, he writes his own code and does a lot of very cool animations, which he will talk about in a minute. Um, let's all clap for Hugh Messi. Hi, hey, how's it going? Um, Wow, look cool to see that you guys got some uh, pretty edgy no, equipment in there. Oh, in there. No, we, don't hear you. we can't hear you, but give it one second. All right, everybody give it up for Hugh Messi. Thank you very much. Uh, is my screen sharing, is the screen sharing working? Yeah, well, we see, yes. She's frozen. Is it, uh, is it frozen well? Okay. Um, I'm just going to start, and uh, hopefully the screen sharing is working. But um, yeah, I've been doing uh, algorithmic embroidery, um, specifically algorithmic embroidery since about my sophomore year when I was at CMU. And um, I had an embroidery machine that was a Brother SE400. I just did like a, like a four inch by four inch area. Um, going into school, but I had no way pretty much of digitizing for it, aside from some like this sort of like crappier uh, programs that you can find like the free online and stuff. Um, and uh, the, the main library that I found to use that let me sort of started working and processing and stuff and exporting was the uh, Pi embroidery library. Uh, so I do uh, basically the main like key that I found that like Steven started doing this was just to work in uh, Python in the Python script. And I, I'll show you the sort of like text format that I use for just like moving points around and stuff. Um, but are you able to see this uh, GitHub repository on my screen? Is it showing in the preview? I'll drop a link, but. We do not see it. Okay, um, let me drop a link in the chat to it. And then open this in a new window, maybe it's really is the is the screen share like if if is it showing a shared screen right now? I might have to select a different screen for it. But uh, okay. any, is, does anyone see it? Is it showing the screen preview? No, one second, sorry. Okay. By clicking that. Um, so this, how do I get it? Uh, I don't have the mouse, <laughs> the uh, trackpad to change screens. Anyone know a quick keypad? Okay, I think four. Fingers. Wait, well, I don't have a swipe. I have one second, Hugh. We're getting there. Okay. Yeah, it's no problem. Let's go back. Oh, yeah. Where are you, Zoom? Oh. Ah. Keep going, Hugh. We still don't see your uh, share screen. Okay, oh, we still okay. your screen, but it's, it's the frozen Zoom. <laughs> oh, it's frozen to the Zoom? Is it, uh, is it showing a window now? No. It should be showing the whole screen. See your mouse pointer moving around, um, and a you have a browser open with three tabs, but it's frozen on the uh, Zoom screen share or the Zoom oh, right. window. All right. there. Okay, I'll, try, that's I'll, fine. I'll just try sharing this again. Sorry about Great. that. Um, Okay, so what I put in this repository was kind of just things that I thought would be, it's, it, I'm still sort of putting it together uh, for my personal use too. Um, but what's in here so far is a few of the basic programs that I use and also the uh, Python script that I was talking about just for exporting. Um, and I can show you this sort of specific way that I, uh, yeah, work with, work with point files. Um, so first thing I wanted to show was just this first um, general digitizer 
that I put together. Um, and this, this is for just doing the basic functionalities that you'd find in um, any embroidery software. That's just for like placing points and, um, and uh, uh, basically defining like satin stitches and running stitches and things like that. And I, I was going to, I was planning on just sharing the whole screen so I could uh, just go back and forth for you, but I think I can switch back and forth. After that. Uh, I'll open up the, I call it a uh, P-thread. This. Um, this you should be able to download and uh, open up in processing and it'll do the sort of basic functionalities that you see. Uh, so if I run this, should be able to share on Zoom. Uh, but just to give you an idea of um, this program, uh, th this is the sort of like action you can see. It's sort of like drawing uh, satin stitches in the way that you would in an, a traditional uh, embroidery program where you're defining two different Bezier curves to like fully articulate the edges of the thing that you're trying to stitch. Um, and I thought I was going to be able to show you a better view of all the different functionalities in it. But it's just sort of a rudimentary program and there's a bunch of keyboard button controls that let you just like rotate the design and flip it and uh, change the ordering that the different things are in. And um, with that, I also have in a separate program, um, a program for doing fill stitches. And these I have in, also in this uh, write up too. But basically uh, the other program takes a bitmap image what sets the key functionality in working with processing is that you can edit images in Photoshop or whatever image editing program. And then uh, basically this program isolates the different sections that can be stitched with a fill stitch. And then you can manually select sort of what shapes uh, are being filled and like what order because the actually you could algorithmically probably go through and uh, have it decide which blocks to fill in in which order, but a lot of times it's better to just be able to do that manually. And then also another functionality of it is that I can take a sort of fitting up image with these lines, and basically the the pattern image, with the lines shows you uh, well it'll it, it basically as it's going through and drawing each of the lines of the fill stitch it'll place a stitch in each of the lines in that image that you give it. And you can get these uh, cool effects, which I'll probably um, upload a video soon of how, basically how that, how that works in action so you can have a little bit better idea of that, uh, that program. Um, but those are basically just two things that I use for uh, doing single, single uh, frame digitizing work. There's no animation in this. Part. Um, but then uh, I think in my junior or senior year, I did an uh, independent study with Golan in the studio. And that was more, I started focusing on doing animation and sort of like programming things that were sort of like catering to the uh, limitations of uh, like the, you know, the amount of time it takes to like produce stuff. And uh, I can show you, yeah, I really wish I could uh, show my full screen. I might be able to update that setting before the end of this, but um, I'll start with the first animation project that I did, and one of the first, was this sort of scene where you have just, it's a person cranking a thing, and there's, you know, this, this procedural effect in the top left was the main like, procedural part of this. Um, but just to break down what's going on here is there's 20 frames and the things that are procedurally generated are the block in the top left with the, with the screen coming off of it and also the frames for the person's animation and also the animation of the stuff coming off the bottom left corner too. And then the rest is manually digitized in that P-thread program. Um, and then if I just scroll down in this doc here, 
Uh, you can see I sort of set up this simple simulation sort of thing where I just exported a block using the fill stage program of just like a set height. And then there's sort of action that's pulling the end of the thread. And then I'll go into a little bit how um, this sort of like forces, the points are sort of simulating, interacting with each other too. You can see like there's an action where it's like, sort of looks like a physical rope that's being pulled. Um, and that uh, in, in this case, it's, it's pulling some from the end. And then as one is being like, if, if the stitch after each one that's stuck in this, this uh, stitch pattern gets pulled far enough, then it sort of like unlocks that stitch and then lets it be pulled out for you. Uh, it's some way of explaining it. But then the next thing that's featured in this is uh, something that's sort of like used, I use a lot in animations, which is just a program for generating squiggly lines from a bitmap image. So you can feed this program just like a set of frames that show silhouettes and sort of just like generates a squiggle within those silhouettes. Um, and then from there, it's just running each of those frames to the program, which I'm gonna have to run automatically. And then uh, having a sort of like set thing that I digitized out in the few thread program and just like combining them together with uh, another processing stretch. Um, and there are a few examples of different things uh, from these specifically that I wanted to show. And one was, well, this I think is kind of, I don't know, this, this one would be interesting to point out that it's all made, it is all digitized manually, so there's not really much like, procedural uh, animation in this one specifically. Um, but for this consistent survey, this was another piece that I think I uh, was working, thinking a lot more about how to make more like efficient loops or make more complicated things happen with the loops. And there's this sort of like demo showing how um, this animation is actually just 20 frames. And you can see it loops every time the ball passes to where you know, the next ball's position is. Um, it sort of resulted in working in this way of looping where you can imagine it's only generating the first one at, at, like, at once, and then it's showing the history every 20 frames of what's behind it. And that sort of just lets you animate these more complicated looping structures within a small set of frames. Mm -hmm. Let me see if there's anything else in this part. And then there's another action map that I was wanting to cover in another uh, to, to another piece. Um, I think this one has a good visual on the website. And this is uh, this is called netting carriage. And you can sort of see. Um, this actually took a still frame that was generated of this sort of like brick pattern. And that was done using the same fill stitch program that I used for the other things. But then I just added like bound ticks for each stitch so it created this brick texture. Um, and then it's, it's running these sort of like rudimentary collisions on it, on that one uh, pattern as it's going down and because that pattern repeats every set distance and it's moving at a set rate then the whole thing repeats every four frames but you can see it's sort of just colliding the points with these boxes as it's going down and then after this final square it's just compressing everything on the uh, x-axis to and then it ends up with these it's kind of interesting lace pattern um, and then I think this one shows pretty well too. Like the, the uh, little people jumping up and grabbing the switches and sort of escalating down. Um, that, that was composited in After Effects. So you can, you can kind of imagine how I sort of have the designs sort of 
predefined by the processing sketches. And then I'm editing together this loop of a person walking and then jumping up, going down, and then repeating that. Um, so you can see every iteration of it. And it loops every about 20 frames or so. And then those full frames that are composited are fed into the program that does the squiggly, squiggle vision sort of thing. So it's draws a squiggly line just estimating those silhouettes. And, and there are a few that would be really good to show the processing sketch for, but this, this piece also shows this sort of like collision action. And there's another one that just uses like spiky balls to like colliding into a set of fill switch stitches. But um, in this, you can sort of imagine that there are these predefined boxes with uh, fill stitches. And then as the silhouette is crawling into it, um, it's just a, displacing the points around it. Um, and the different textures in this, you can sort of see the, um, the red stitches, the motion is being carried through, like all the collisions and sort of just like carrying through and they're staying like that. Um, but then the metallic stitches, and this is sort of like a metallic thread, those stitches are being reset every frame, but they're still being collided with the silhouette. So they're more, staying more like caught with uh, the program. I wanted to show this one too. I have the program sort of simulation running, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to show that. Um, I can have the frames. But the way that I'm doing something that was, I think, I'm not sure if it was the first time I did this, but um, these are animations, these are procedural animations that are being driven by frames that I animate in After Effects. So it's like in this piece, the reference footage is this black silhouette of the person doing this motion with this sort of like stitching gun. And then there's a red point at the tip of it and a green point at where like the back of it is. And so that's using, uh, it's using, it's like the, in processing, it's just going through and finding where that red dot and green dot are and using that as the position for the source of the animation. Um, and then sort of like running this other stuff where it's shooting out the end and then conforming to a specific pattern as it like goes down. So I think that was me. That was the bulk of the effects that I wanted to show. Also, oh yeah, there was another. There's another project that sort of more clearly illustrates the sort of like when like adding more like fluid motion to things. And said so in this piece, this is the full thing. So it's like it's a dollar bill. It comes in and sort of like expands and then explodes. Um, and so there's a few, there's just a few diagrams in here. So this shows like just starting with the points as I've predefined them. So I've just manually digitized um, the hundred dollar bill with stitches. And then this view just shows um, sort of like randomized forces sort of exploding it. Um, and then this view shows um, how there's, you can have the forces exploding it, but then there's also a secondary, there's secondary forces that are holding all the points to their initial um, position, like where they are initially. Um, and so basically the farther the points stray from their original position, the more force is applied to, to like pull them back. And that uh, adds this sort of elastic motion to it. And there's, so there's that way of holding it together, but then there's also a different way of doing it, which is, I call them like jello objects. But uh, what's happening in this is instead of just pulling the points towards their initial position, it's setting, pulling the points towards where they're supposed to be relative to the points around it, like on either side. So it's taking like a set distance and angle and then um, sort of like nudging it in that direction more and more depending on how much you want to do that. 
So then this, this whole sequence was made up of three different, it's sort of like three different sections. And this one was ran in reverse. So it started as a solid bill, and then there's just an animation that drags one point down and the rest follows, and it's played in the reverse. Um, and then this part, it's sort of expanding and holding all the points together to the original position. But then there's the point that it pops, and then it changes to it's holding everything together locally. And then it's really um, And then also in this repo, I have just, I'm not sure how usable these scripts specifically will be, but I did try to sort of like document them. I know the uh, field pixels program, that doesn't really have a readme yet, but um, I do have this, like this file, the way you use it is kind of weird. You just replace you have to load the text files that you output into a specific folder and then just like change the name of it and run it in Python. Um, but this is, this is another, I don't know, another sort of like key thing about uh, the way that I do it that I wanted to show, which is that you can just like store a list of 2D points in any text file. And that's sort of how I will be working with a list of 2D points in one program like generating the stitches in the build stitch program and then using it in the uh, other one for like simulating effects onto it. Um, but it's kind of just like the simplest way I could do it. Uh, in the program, you have a bunch of points that are for this XY and then in the text file, it's just listing like XY, 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 XY. So it's just, uh, just like alternating down. Each line is a different uh, coordinate. Um, and then one other thing that I wanted to show was how to use, I was doing a bunch of work um, animating these and processing. So I'd, I would export and have, um, you know, you stitch it out and photograph them and you can make a stop motion. Um, but I also did some testing, um, sort of interactive animations in P5.js. And so this was, um, this was, I, I'm not sure if this was the first example of this. And hopefully this doesn't slow my computer down too much. But, uh, I'll just let it look first. And it usually takes a while to load because it has to load all the pictures that were stitched. But you can see there's this sort of interaction with this where um, what I stitched was basically this sort of symmetrical 3D sculpture from a bunch of different orientations and sort of using the fact of its symmetry so that you can sort of imagine like this frame and pretty much this frame are the same image and the same like stitch output near. And the same with like this frame and this frame are probably the same images. Um, but there's basically two sets. So there's, there's two stitches done of each angle. So it can actually still has the flickering effect even when it's not moving. Um, and then sort of just lets you interact with it as a 3D object and you sort of we orbit around it. I use the arrow keys to, to spin through it. Um, but yeah, that's just an example of a 3D, uh, sort of like 3D viewer of 2D frames. Um, and this was another one. This is not, probably not as complicated, but um, this is actually a random outcome generator. So there's four different outcomes for like each of the different suits. And it may show, but it may not be. But yeah, so it, so it plays through and there's a set of 16 frames basically of the ball falling and then being rolled until it hits the back wall. And then there's six frames for each of the outcomes of 
hearts, spades, clubs, and diamonds. And so it plays those original 16 frames, and then the right moment it'll inject the other frames of the outcome so that it's so the ball has sort of like continuous motion down each of these uh, different like tubes. So it's another sort of specific, this one's very specific uh, in terms of the structure. Um, so I thought to include that uh, just for general uh, things. Um, this one I used, this was a, a Herbert, Hilbert noise. I was using a bunch of frames from the uh, animation of the Hilbert curve that I did. And something sort of interesting because I haven't sort of you know, shown this one today, but uh, it's sort of, this is the view underneath on the stabilizer and you can sort of see where the top thread tension is sort of like low enough that it gets pulled into these more uh, smoother curves. And then that sort of just gets affected by the stitches that are added um, for each iteration. And then the, the interactive part of this, not super interactive, but um, it just shows just moving along the noise function. So it's like creating a sort of like fluctuating noise wave showing each aspect of this uh, sequence. There was an example of a clock that I put in here. And this is just showing each of these loops. There's a loop for each stage of this that gets shown every hour. You can sort of imagine programming that based on uh, the time variables that you can grab from P5JS. And then, yeah, this last sort of interactive one, it's probably the most specific, but it basically, it takes um, a single image with a bunch of lines in it, and there's a bunch of dots and a bunch of lines in this image. And this isn't even really related to the algorithmic embroidery, but it's like algorithmic in post. Um, okay, not much audio. Um, you can sort of see, if I, as I click and drag, it'll show this sort of line that's animating still relative to the rest of the sort of like cloud of points and lines that's flashing around. And so what it is, is there's a single image of, I'll copy the link to it, maybe. But there's a single image with a bunch of posted lines that I hand embroidered onto it. And then I just went through and I mapped out where the beginning and ends of each of those lines is and where the points are. And then in this P5 sketch, it's basically just animating an interaction between just these two points and the cursor. So there's one that stays very close to the cursor and the other one gets like flung around, around it. And then you can sort of like click and you drag, sort of like a, I don't know, it says like a tape measure effect sort of. Um, and then the way that it renders is that it takes the distance between those two points that you're trying to animate and then finds the line in the image that's basically like closest to that length and then um, renders it at the, the right size. Um, yeah, I think that covers most, it covers everything that I've added in this um, repository. Um, I think I got, I wasn't able, I wish I could show you more specifics of like the simulation stuff in processing. Um, but I think we, we did cover a good amount of uh, what I was trying to today. So I um, wanted to open to um, any questions too, if anyone has any questions about the process. I know it's kind of like rushed a little. Uh, scrambled in presentation, but you, yeah, you have ten minutes if you want to. I can actually walk. Like, if anyone has questions, cool. Okay. Cool. Yeah, or yeah, I can I can repeat what folks say. I guess. Okay. Cool. Um, so Hugh, the question is, um, uh, what do you, um, so kind of, 
Um, what is what do you feel kind of physicalizing the actual kind of uh, digital from the digital actually adds to the pieces? Like, what is that process like? Yeah, I think the, the main aspect of it is there's a lot of surprising effects that sort of arise from just having going from a list of points to um, working with embroidery. And I think I've, I've been just interested in sort of like working too with, um, there's a specific, there was another specific thing I wanted to show. It was more in, in terms of um, specifically like tactile effects with it. Um, but also I think it, it, it's sort of, it's sort of like attention capturing in terms of the fact that when you're looking at it's each frame is individually stitched and that there is a sort of um, confusion between the virtual and the physical aspects of it. Um, and so I just, just quickly wanted to show in this in this program, this sort of like bitmap display um, was a thing that I just wanted to try out, but it was basically increasing the top thread tension of Bunge so that all the little black dots in this sort of like pixel display are the bottom thread sort of like coming up because the top thread tension is so high. Um, but that just sort of lets you do a fill stitch and then have a specific um, have a specific like pattern that shows up underneath and working with colors that way. Um, you really want to do like the map images. Um, but yeah, I guess there's, there's, there's a lot of surprising outcomes when you're working, when you're like making something uh, this way, just because there's, it's a lot more, there's a lot more, I would say like, like more so than like plotting and mark, plot, like a plotter with marker. Um, the constraints like, having to form a continuous line always through it definitely, uh, I think just like affects like the qualities of it as a whole too. And definitely affects how I point out each of the, each of like the, the animations and stuff. Yeah. I was wondering if you ever explored um, making the animations physical or Zoetrope or like a flipbook or anything? Uh, so the question was, have you ever explored um, actually using like a zoetrope or a flipbook kind of method of creating the animations? Or just any exploration of that kind? Yeah, I think that would be really interesting to see. And I think, I think it would definitely be cool as some sort of like exhibition um, installment. Uh, I have done, I'm not sure if it shows. Um, I did a sort of sculptural homage to it, but it was not like, it wasn't like a workable thing at all. It was just like a way of just like winding them up into this bobbin. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't created any actual like, uh, for like zoetrope or, I, I can imagine a sort of like crank mechanism that like flips them through. But yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried that yet. Um, well, Hugh, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for, for being here. Um, does everyone want to give a hand for Hugh? And, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also the, um, the GitHub repo. Yeah. Feel free to use like any of that stuff. It might be very difficult to parse through. I'm not sure. I've never had anybody else use it before. So, um, yeah, anything you want to check out from that? Yeah, thank you for sending that over. I, I did, so for everyone in the room, I linked that GitHub um, in our kind of the, the Hugh Messy kind of lecture um, section of the, the web page that uh, I sent out earlier today. So, um, and um, okay, awesome. Um, thanks again, Hugh. Um, and uh, I guess we'll kind of move into um, uh, kind of, we'll wait for Leah for a few minutes. But uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> okay, y'all. I'm going to bring kind of the attention to the front of the room. Um, so I'd like to introduce Leia Alba. Um, she is uh, a wonderful human being and uh, kind of um, text. She has worked in kind of uh, the textiles lab and with the Morphic Matter Lab over in HCI. Um, and I'm going to kind of let her give more wordage to her background and her work. So. Okay. Hi, everybody. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Right. I love you all too. Um, hi. I'm going to say the same thing I said in my textiles class today, which is today's been kind of a lot, so this might be a little scattered. But I think in this context, maybe scattered can sometimes be good. Um, but throw a couple threads out there. Did not mean to say that. Um, <laughs> it happens. And you can tie them up yourselves. Yes, no, we'll tie them up together. Um, so uh, here we are in an embroidery workshop, and David asked me to, to talk to you all. And I was like, about what? And he was like, you know, I don't know. I was like, uh, yeah, we should be back with the screen. We're good. There we go. Um, about what, right? And uh, I was like, okay, yeah, I mean, I did this render for embroidery. I was going to do some embroidery animations. Like, it didn't. And also, you've all already heard from Hugh today, right? So, like, that is covered. <laughs> Way better than I did. Uh, and then I was like, okay, I did this once. I tried to uh, re implement this paper on metamaterial mechanisms, which is a fun topic. And I was like, oh, I can do this with freestanding machine embroidery. Did y'all talk about this way of doing like lace? Not yet. Not yet. So there's, a, okay, not yet, you will later. It'll come to you later. Um, and I was like, I can, I can like smash these things together. And I, I did one and, is it moving? It's not moving. It's not moving because I have a knife. Uh, did one and then I broke a needle and I didn't have any more needles and I like wandered away and never thought about it again. So um, I was like, what, what do you even want to talk about? <laughs> and David's like, the real-time interactive embroidery? I'm like, oh yeah, 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 I did that. Okay, the best known of these is thread setting. Um, thread setting was exhibited at the Game Developers Conference. It won an award at Indicate. Hooray, amazing. Leia, what are you talking about? Um, one person in the room knows what I'm talking about at least, because um, this is his work as well. Didn't know you'd be here, Jim. So this is Jim's work as well. Um, this, thread setting. Um, at the GDC, people say, what is this? And I'd say, well, very seriously, it's a two-player territory control game for quilting and embroidery machines. Yes, OK. Um, so this is a Singer Quantum Futura embroidery machine. Um, it's less nice than the machines you have around you in almost every way. The way that it is not less nice is that uh, it can do real-time streaming data over USB. I don't know if any of yours do that. No, you all have to like compile a thing and physically move it over, <laughs> whatever. Um, everything else about this machine is way less good though, for what it's worth. Um, but it can do real-time streaming. And uh, another thing to notice is that this is not an off-the-shelf singer Quantum Futura. This one's been modified. It has a, uh, a gamer panel <laughs> instead, of, instead of a bunch of sliders for choosing a stitch, right? Uh, custom controller, it's, it's an Arduino, right? So we like pulled out the old panel, we shoved a new one in. Uh, it's got six lit buttons. It's also got, it's kind of hard to see in this picture. Um, it's got these little indicator lights that shine through this really high quality wood veneer effect that I made by putting a piece of wood on a photocopier. Um, so it's like a really high quality experience is what I'm trying to say. Um, and the game itself, it takes place on these little fabric rectangles. So we printed up like spoon flower, I think. There's lots of ways to get fabric printed these days. Um, and it's a two player game. So you alternate taking turns. There's a, a gameplay story where we kind of rationalize what the rules are, where we say that the two players are basically frenemies that are captains, alternate captains of a, an exploring party. Their goal is to explore all of these beautiful hex tiles in the land of Fred studying and yet the words are not good in this game. Um, but they're supposed to be exploring as much territory as they can. And every morning the, the party wakes up and one of the two captains alternating chooses which direction we're going in. We're going to walk in that direction as far as we can, um, which depends on how much, like, what kind of terrain it is. It's really easy to walk over yellow, I think. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, we, have these, we have these written out. Um, so basically, each move is choosing a direction. You're trying to kind of capture as many tiles as you can. But you're also, of course, trying to keep the other person from capturing as many tiles as you can. And uh, at the end of the game, um, the embroidery machine, embroidered out the score, 
uh, or sorry, this is, so this is what it looks like when it was mistaken, right? We, we do uh, it's embroiders in that direction of embroidering the emblem of the captain. So there's like spiral captain and cloverleaf captain, right? It goes through and marks each tile. Um, there are different game boards, by the way. We had a whole tangent on like generating game boards. Actually, many of them were terrible. We, we learned pretty quickly. Um, basically, the game ends though when you've been all the, the pale pink hexagons, which are like the cities. Um, and then each player gets a point for every tile they explored, and I think three points for cities. I, I may have been home quote me on any of this. Um, but the point is that at the end of the game, the machine comes up here and embroidered in our score. And something interesting about this process is it going, it's not going. Okay. Something interesting about this process is that actually very few people kept their own score, which is ridiculous. So you literally just count the tiles. Um, but because it's an embroider machine and it's not fast, this is actually really tense. Both players will be sitting here and like, what's the number gonna be? <laughs> um, and it matters because I mean this. Okay, first of all, GDC people are cutthroat about games anyway, right? Like we had this one couple or siblings or something that were there for a very like an hour. I don't know. It felt like a very very long time because neither of them was willing to cede territory to the other one at all. <laughs> um, and it matters because you're gonna get a prize. The winner is gonna get a prize. They're gonna get a cool piece of fabric that's embroidered in a thing. And we're only making one, right? This is the nature of thread setting is that you get an object out at the end and there's two players. So there are stakes here. I mean, they're incredibly mild stakes, but in a sense, they're real. So here's one thing that is interesting about thread setting. Um, one of the takeaways, getting a physical thing out of a game is fun and interesting. This is a chill talk, so we're not going to unpack like fun or interesting. Like this, this is like a seminar level topic. Um, I, this could be a whole talk, and I actually think it'd be a fun one, but not today. Today's embroidery. Uh, but so let's say that one of a thing that can be fun and interesting is having stakes in the physical world. And I actually don't mean like necessarily getting a physical thing out of a game. I could have actually written this instead, like altering the physical world <laughs> with a computer game, because my other not my other favorite. I like this one much more, actually. One of my favorite examples of this is um, this project called Destructive Games, creating value by destroying physical objects. Uh, this is a published human computer interaction paper. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Uh, where they're playing games on a laser cutter. They're playing two player high stakes games on a laser cutter. The one you see on the slide is like tug of war, but you put your actual money down on the bed of the laser cutter. Um, and they, they, in the caption, it says, surprisingly, we found that eight out of 12 players would play again. And I'm like, actually, it's really surprising. I, I think it sounds really fun. Um, they have this other game, which is just like a paragon of game design simplicity. Red is trying to push yellow's car into the laser. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's gold. It's beautiful. I have no idea how many times they played this game. I can't imagine it was more than once. Um, but who knows? So it's crisp. I, I it's it's good. Um, okay, so that's cool. Altering things in the real world. It's a, it's an interesting way to give some weight to a game. It's even if it's not a game game. I don't know. Whatever. Um, let's go back to another thing. I said thread setting is for a game two player territory control game for quilting and embroidery machines. Have, has anyone ever worked on a quilting machine? Not you, Jim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. So for those of you who have not worked on a quilting machine, basically an embroidery machine but big. There are some nuances here around differences in how they're controlled, actually. But still just think of it as a very large XY plotter where what's being plotted is is sewing. Um, it's really hard to find like a reference picture of one of these that shows, but ours is 13 feet wide. 13 feet wide. Um, Thread setting was actually originally designed for one of these. The, the one I showed you before is the like Game Boy Portable Edition, um, you know, put, put your pocket. Um, but it was actually originally intended for one of these. And I have shockingly few pictures <laughs> of, of the process of making this thing. Um, but I do have this one. Um, this was one of, not the very first board, but one of the early boards. Those tiles are hand stamped definite stakes in playing this game. Uh, you can probably tell that that's me and Jim in the picture. A uh, couple things to note here. So obviously the board is bigger. Um, 
at this scale, maybe it becomes a little bit clearer the kind of visual language of quilt tile patches that we were trying to evoke initially. That's the thing. But the other thing that I want to draw your attention to in this picture that's very different from the original version versus portable, uh, it's a little bit subtle in this picture, but I'm about to take my move. And I'm about to do it by pressing directly on the fabric itself. Uh, there's a little ring of lit switches, it kind of looks like the one on portable, um, but it's mounted to the sew head of the machine. So on the quilting machine, the whole sew head is moving around instead of like, it's kind of inverted. Um, so these buttons and lights are always in the same position relative to the needle and the light shines through the fabric. It kind of feels like the fabric itself is the interface, right? And it feels like when you're making your choice of direction, you're like setting out in that direction from the relative position of the needle itself. Um, you're making a movement decision that's like immediate and clear and you kind of know what the scale of things are. So here's a good thing, right? Interacting directly on materials, also fun and interesting. Again, a lot of meanings packed into those words. This is a concept that comes up a lot in my home field of human computer interaction. Um, David said I was going to introduce myself, but I didn't. Uh, so a little bit more about me is that I am a PhD student in human computer interaction, and I specifically work mostly in fabrication, um, typically with fabrication machines, typically mostly with fabric fabrication machines. Um, but in the broader field of the broader, so tiny, niche, broader field of um, fabrication stuff in HCI, there's a, there's a sort of a trendy topic, which is on machine interaction. Um, there's a couple of researchers in particular who do a lot with this, um, who I'm often very inspired by. Um, this one, Kwai Shu, was at CMU for a while, not when he was doing this, but shortly before it. Um, so this is a very like touchstone project called Roma. Interactive fabrication with augmented reality and a robotic 3D printer. There's a bunch of technical hacks going on here to make this possible, but basically, for a user of the system, they're always they're basically doing a design of a thing directly on a 3D printer, a highly modified 3D printer that can print super fast. It's printing super low res. Um, what it means to be printing low res is also an interesting topic. Um, and then there's also like this AR overlay that's always showing like a couple steps ahead. Um, there's also this, uh, another system, this is one of my very favorite systems in this area. Um, Stephanie Mueller also worked on a previous system I just showed you. She's, in my opinion, like the best researcher <laughs> in, in this kind of interactive fabrication area. Um, this is, a, it's essentially glass blowing, but with uh, acrylic plexiglass um, and a sort of highly automated system. So if you gesture over this thing, the computer will figure it will heat up the plastic for you and then it'll put some air pressure in. But for you, the user, it's just going to kind of feel like I'm like magicking up bubbles in air, um, which is maybe a kind of a funny way of saying like direct material because you're not really touching it. But you are seeing it in, in real life, in real scale with the actual material properties it's going to have. Um, this is a, a slide from Stephanie's talk about that project I just showed you. Um, and so she apparently lays out a possibility space here as that, you know, maybe there's historically kind of computing systems where you do like you process a job, right? Like back in the day, punch cards, right? With a computer, you like fill your cards, you hope you didn't make a mistake, you like go to your assigned slot, uh, you feed the cards in the machine, you find your mistake, you come back tomorrow. Um, which is kind of the way that a lot of 3D printing works, right? Um, it's a little bit unfortunate. We could probably do better. That's one of the premises, right, that the interactive fabrication folks are saying. It's like, maybe it'd be nice to catch your mistakes a little earlier. Maybe. Um, especially because so much of interactive, or so much of fabrication machinery, I don't take this opinion, but a lot of people who work with fabrication machinery essentially consider it rapid prototyping, right? It is a series of technologies that people do to prototype a physical object. Um, like an industrial designer is like, is this phone going to feel good in my hand? I don't know. Let's print it. Let's hold it. Um, so there is this kind of paradigm of working with fabrication where we are trying to get out of prototyping mentality. And yet we still do this thing where we like send a job and walk away for however long. And, and so Stephanie's camp and, and researchers like Stephanie is like, well, OK, let's uh, least maybe make this something a little bit more turn-taking-y. Um, you know, maybe 
Um, there's a bunch of there's no good time today, so I'm not gonna talk about all of them. Um, there's a bunch of systems where it's like, oh, I'm gonna like take a move, and then maybe the machine will integrate that in some way. Uh, and then and then with something like FormFab, which I just showed you, she's saying, well, okay, what if this could even actually be continuous? Um, for the rest of this talk, I'm mostly not talking about continuous. It's, first of all, it's a lot harder to implement, um, and there's just fewer examples. Um, but I think you should. I think it might be interesting for you to keep in mind the idea that there is perhaps a continuum of interaction, temporally speaking, uh, and that that continuum can have kind of qualitative effects, right? That, that there's a very real qualitative difference between I send a job to a printer versus I send a little bit of a job to a printer and then I'll send a little bit more or something a little more versus I am somehow collaborating like a wizard um, making a thing in real life. And, and I want to be clear that I think that last thing is not always what you want, right? Actually, sometimes it's good to have sort of front-loaded the thinking about a thing, right? Uh, if you look at other processes that are not at all digitally mediated, there are times when you do want to improvise, there are times when you don't want to improvise. So, improvise. so I am maybe perhaps, unlike the implication of this slide from Stephanie's deck, I'm not implying that I think that this is like a betterness <laughs> spectrum, but, but it is a experiential difference spectrum for sure. Um, yes. Okay. So what have I done with my slides here? Yeah. Okay. I didn't mention this is what I say. I, we're, we'll get there. Um, so on that note, let's talk about an interactive embroidery system. This one's not by me. This is by uh, Nara Alhuda Hamdan. I have never met her. I've read a couple of papers she seemed to have. Um, so I don't know maybe some of the underlying details of this system. Uh, but it is a system that is intended for e-textiles production using uh, an embroidery machine. Those of you in the room who've either been in my e-textiles class before or who are currently in my e-textiles class, thank you all for coming. Um, know that e-textiles is a domain where you're often juggling multiple possible things like the aesthetics and also the functionality and also the well functionality in terms of like how it's going to work but then also how you're going to make it there's like all these kind of factors that you're sort of simultaneously juggling um so this system uh is proposed to help you maybe abstract away a little bit of the functionality and give you a little bit more like material directness. The idea of this thing is that you're gonna like doodle directly on your fabric that's hooked up um, where you might want some traces to be, where you might want some components to be, and then you're gonna like scan it. There's a bunch of image processing stuff. And then it's gonna like reify that as embroidery onto the fabric you doodled on completely tangentially. But I'm just gonna say this because I don't know. I it's interesting. It reminds me of a thing that people used to do where they would have celebrities autograph the thing and then they'd like embroider over it. I I don't know. I just I think it's interesting this idea of taking an ephemeral trace and like per permanizing it. People do that these days and people do this with tattoos, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> um, which is, I mean, it's conceptually similar. Um and, 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 yeah. so same basic idea, right? You're <laughs> just like taking a pen, you're drawing on a thing. Um um, draw out a thing literally. I think that I think there's a couple different colors of pen for like I want this one to be a conductive thread versus I want this one to be like a decorative thread. Whatever. Um, you put it in the system and it does the thing. Uh, a cute a cute part of this is that they have these life size like at one to one scale sticker representations of the various widgets that you might want to integrate into an e-textile circuit. So like there's like a little battery board here. There's like a little LED board. So the user is not expected to remember like how big these things are. They could just put them directly on that uh, as placeholders. This is another big thing about on material, you know, interfaces because it turns out that real size is actually really difficult. Uh, you have maybe run into this in your life if you do much with fabrication. Uh, there is an interesting paper by some people I know. One of them is my advisor. I feel like I always feel like I need to caveat this stuff. Um, understanding uncertainty in measurement and accommodating of impact in 3D printing. Because this happens, right? Like even if you basically know what you're doing, when you measure a thing, all these little discrepancies come up. Like, oh, should I be measuring to the edge of the phone? I, I don't know. Maybe my ruler's slightly broken. And this stuff gets a million times worse if you don't know what you're doing, um, which 
many people often do. Not everybody knows what they're doing, always. Shocker. Um, and so this is, I would really, really recommend looking into this paper. First of all, if you're ever feeling frustrated about measuring things, um, but secondly, if you ever want to like make a fabrication system for somebody else, to understand some of the problems about like how people bridge that gap in that direction, right? If I have a physical object and I want to like print something to match it, I'm going to need to measure this object somehow. It's a mess. Um, so one of the big arguments for on-machine interfaces is like, let's not do this, actually. Let's just put the object in the system. Let's let the system deal with it. I mean, obviously, there's going to be calibration, right? Like the system itself is going to need to understand what a real world unit is, depending on the way you're getting that data in. in there can be math nightmares, but at least it's not the user's math nightmare. So a slightly practical version of this. We're going to go. OK. This one is another one of mine. Uh, this is the most practical of the three systems I'm going to show you for this machine. And if you're like, this isn't very practical, you're right. Um, this is a project I did uh, while I was visiting Boulder with um, Professor Laura Devendorf there, who has this beautiful Jacquard Loom. Um, Jacquard Loom is for weaving. The Jacquard Loom is specifically for computational weaving, right? So it can allow you to do very complex patterns without having to remember where every thread is, which is great because there's 1,340 threads, I think. I don't even remember how many there are, much less remember what each of them should be doing. Um, so it's a highly automated, complex piece of equipment that in typical use, people design patterns for using Photoshop. Um, which is apparently a very effective process. People make beautiful things with this process, but it's definitely going to have all these problems about like how big is a thing, how big is uh, how big is that thing relative to other things in the world, right? I'm probably going to have to do this watch and find out. So here's a, a little a little sketch of an interface where I'm like, oh, just put some blobs directly on where you're going to leave. There's a camera that you can't see up at the top of the screen, uh, and it's it's. I 100% cheated here, I will admit to all of you all today, it's looking for orange things. This will not work for anything that's not orange. But that stuff is orange, so we're good. Um, actually, well, yeah, ask me later. Um, so you can make these little orange blobs. Um, at the time, also in the lab, there was another weaver who was, who was actually using a process very much like this, completely unprompted by me, um, prompted basically by like, Matisse, right, and like cutouts as a, as a form of composition. So I'm like, see, this is legit. People like to arrange blobs. Um, and the point being is, I can make a thing, I can make a composition, I can scooch stuff around, I can see basically what it's going to look like, you know, in terms of scale at least, and then I can weave it, which is slow. Weaving is slow. Harrison, please don't make fun of me for how badly I throw the show. <laughs> There's no. No hazing and there is no hazing and weaving. That's true. Especially not in Laura's lab. Laura's lab is very, very fine people. So could you explain what happened if the orange blobs went down? Yeah, so the orange blobs went down, and then I went over to my computer, um, and I hit the space bar. Right. And I'm running a processing sketch on the computer itself that is grabbing the webcam image at that time. The webcam is pointed right down at the work where the, where the paper blobs were. It's doing a bunch of image fix-up stuff. It's doing some leaving specific fix-up stuff that is tangential enough from you. Talk one on one if you want. Um, and then it is sending those row by row instructions um, on request to the loom. I'm also alighting a bit here about how this loom doesn't normally get real time data and we can some hackery. Don't tell this company. It's not real hackery. It's fine. Um, yeah, so this is like, this is, this is one, but they'll on machine interaction. And I'm like, all right, I, I like it, I kind of think this is the most boring one. No, I said it's the most practical one, which is not a synonym for boring, but it is. Um, <laughs> it was one of my advisors like the best. Uh, it's okay, we got this thing going, let's do something, I don't know, weirder. Um, this one's an homage to Golan, I think I've told him that before. Um, if I'm weaving in the real world, maybe I can use the weaving as some kind of trace about its own process. This one's a slit scan photograph. Um, so every time I go up to weave a new row, actually, well, every time I have just finished weaving a new row, um, this time there's a camera pointed at me, you know, right at me, my face. Uh, right as I request a new row, it takes a picture of my face, it grabs, you know, where we are in the picture, turns that into a satin pattern, um, and then we weave that row. 
So this is something where there's this, still a physical input. It's not a direct physical input. Um, it's, it's very not direct. Actually, this was a really weird reading for me because I really felt like I was doing like a performance, <laughs> right? I'm like, weave and smile. Um, <laughs> I, I put on a lot of makeup for, I mean, it's probably obvious. I put on a lot of makeup for this also, which the rest of the lab thought was really funny because I was in Boulder, Colorado in the summer. I'm like, people are not even wearing shoes. And here I am. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but that's what, this, that's what this project was, right? It was about like capturing this kind of moment in time and this, this weaving process. Um, physical input, a little bit less direct. Not a physical input at all, the a third thing I did with this, um, but still about on-machine interaction in an abstract sense. This is Twitch Plays Loom, a real Loom, not the 1985 graphical adventure game. Um, that's the whole name of this project. Uh, and as you might be able to tell, what's happening here is that I'm streaming the leaving process in real time. <laughs> uh, we can call that real time. Twitch has a bit of lag to it. Um, and a bunch of my nerd friends are watching me do it. And they have a little clicky interface that they can click on individual interlacements to change them, which is a, like incredibly ineffective way of altering leaves. I want to be clear. Um, I was kind of trying to throttle them a little bit, basically. Um, this, again, full honesty in this room was 100% kind of as a joke. The joke is that Twitch is where loud, fast things happen, and weaving is, actually it is loud on a TC2, but it's not fast. Um, and I don't think my viewers could tell that it was loud, because it was loud in that white noise way that the camera is just filtering out. Um, so, I, like I said, I took this as a joke. It's like, oh man, here we are a really exciting thing on Twitch. Um, and this is 100% selection bias also, right? Like I said, this is my nerd friends. Um, so they didn't even comment on that at all. They're like, yeah, here we are, watching weaving on Twitch, obviously. Um, but these being a particular kind of nerd friends I have that mostly are not fabrication people, the thing they thought was interesting was actually that they're like, I'm clicking a button and a real thing's happening. I'm moving my finger in like New York and fabric is happening in Boulder. And this was like, many of them said pretty much exactly that kind of thing, right? That it was mind blowing to them that something physical was coming out of this like inconsequential or, you know, even stupid feeling action that they were doing. Um, so that was interesting because it was not at all how I was thinking about it. I was like, we're gonna get chaos. It's gonna be a mess. It's gonna be a great mess. And I wanna be clear, it was actually a bit of a mess because my nerd friends briefly figured out that they could script their clicks in the JavaScript interface. Um, and because somehow I didn't see this coming and did not ruggedize my server. And so like, okay, it looked like this for about 30 seconds and then the server crashed. Um, thanks guys. Uh, which is a note, I should have let them do this on purpose, right? Like I probably should have actually supported that. Maybe done like a modicum of debugging. We all learn. Okay. I take you back, a, I think, out in these slides to talk a little bit more about embroidery again, because we are here to talk about embroidery. Um, and these are, to my mind, actually very related projects. Maybe it's a little bit more tenuous. So this is a project I did, I didn't do actually at all. Um, it's a project I helped with at the very end. He Chin Lee, who was at the time a um, computational design master student. Are any of you in that program? Just curious. Master's no. Interesting. Um, so this is work that came out of her thesis project. This is not her thesis. This is like a spin-off paper um, that happened basically after she graduated, but the underlying tech is from her thesis project. Um, and then we were talking about it. I was like, this is so much fun. Let's have more fun with it. And then we did. We wrote this pictorial. Both of her advisors didn't want anything to do with it, so we published it and we got a best tutorial award, so let that be a lesson. Um, so the underlying technical system here, uh, which also has a spin-off paper, like if you're curious about the technical system, there's a cigarette paper about this, which I had nothing to do with. Um, like I said, I did not do any of this implementation. Uh, it's kind of similar actually to the sketch and stitch system I showed you. So it's something where you're going to like sketch directly on some fabric, which is hooped up. It's going to go into a camera system. There's like some little traditionals there. It can do some bunch of rectifying, image processing. I'm assuming it's all kind of open CD stuff. And then it does some kind of generation stuff. And if you ask Yi Chin what kind of generation it does, she's like, oh, you know, things 
Um, there are details in the SIGGRAPH paper, but it does a bunch of weird little generation stuff that quirky things. Um, it's in some sense reacting to what's already drawn. I mean, it is reacting to what's already drawn the thing, but it's not like filling the shapes. It's, it's playing off them and they're seeing this. And she, um, so this is like the thesis work, right? And then, and then afterwards she, well, she intended this to be part of the thesis where she was gonna do these workshops um, with a bunch of people and several of these modified embroidery machines and it was going to do a kind of exquisite corpse thing where people were going to make a swatch with the machine helping them. So a person, a machine collaborating for a while, and then all these swatches were going to be sewed together and it's going to be like a cool, big, glorious quilt. And then the pandemic happened, so we didn't do that. Um, what we did it, well, she didn't do that, um, but she was kind of bummed about it and she's like, let's, let's talk about other things we can do with this project. And, this is where I was like, let's, let's do a thing. We did a like a little play by mail um, thing instead. So it was kind of like this, but over a couple weeks instead, um, very slowly with the machines, uh, which I think is interesting. I'm going to align against the video because I'm on that. Yeah, we'll scoop. Actually, no, I'm actually totally wrong. Another project with Yi Ching, because um, she was out with these embroidery machines. Um, this, by the way, is this. I think literally the same machine as the, it's one of the thread setting machines um, that she was working with. Another thing when we were talking about why embroidery, right? Because she was getting a lot of questions for people on this work. Like, why does it need to be embroidery? Why can't it just be a pen plotter? And she's like, well, can you write? <laughs> but there's something about embroidery. And, and so in a bunch of conversations I was having with her at the time, I'm like, okay, you know, one of the cool things about embroidery, you can actually attach stuff, right? It's not just a pen plotter. You can like, put stuff in there if you're careful, within reason. Um, and so I was like, well, I mean, you can probably actually build a thing. In fact, you do, right? This is actually a thing. I don't know if anybody's run across this kind of embroidery product before on the like, Pinterest corners of the internet. This is uh, an in the hoop project. So this is a way that embroidery patterns are sold sometimes. Like you might buy an embroidery pattern that's intended for this style of construction um, where it is a little bit of a collaborative thing. It's like the machine will put down a little line. It's like, here's where the zipper goes. And then the person tapes in a zipper and then the machine like embroiders over it. This is the first couple steps of making a little coin purse basically. So this is apparently an established technique in obvious embroidery machine usage, which is cool. And so we're like, we should probably try to get, a, I don't know, a poster or something out of this. So we did, we got exactly a poster out of it. It just has a lot of problems. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting technique, and so I want to you know, consider this. I put this in the realm of interactive embroidery because it, it, it actually requires quite a bit of interaction. Um, but I think there's potentials for interesting interaction here, is what I'm trying to say. So we start with a tearaway substrate. We're cheap, so we use a paper towel. Um, and then the machine shows you where it wants you to put a thing. And then you put a thing there with Scotch tape. This was also, I mean, there's definitely better ways to do this. Um, and then you're building up these little like two part modules and you can like stack them on top of each other. There's a bunch of like unpleasantness about module stacking order that I think like, a, I don't know, a mathematician would maybe enjoy or maybe just tell me I can't do it at all. Um, we did it by bending fabric a lot. Uh, it tape, a lot of tape. So there's like this stacking procedure. We made it grasshopper. Patch, should I call them patches and grasshopper? I don't know. We made a grasshopper thing. Um, here's a Stanford bunny. Uh, so those of you who do any kind of graphics research you know that if you were making a fabrication machine, it's, it's like minimum viable fabrication machine has to make a Stanford bunny. So we get it, we're good. Um, made this like Oscar Schlemmer ballet pants thing, which is are fun. Um, and the point though is that all of this is made in this like weird kind of ad hoc layer based manner, which is exactly what sewing machines are good at. And I think in the poster reader. It's a strange claim, but we make it, which is to say that sometimes people have a hard time sewing non, like beginning sewers have a hard time sewing non-flat surfaces and so much of clothing is like curved seams to curved seams. And actually like that's a perfectly fine way to make three-dimensional objects um, if you don't mind this aesthetic, which I think is kind of cool. So interactive fabrication, in a sense, maybe it could be more interactive. Actually, I think that could be interesting. Um, and so I have a, a little bit of Pivot at the end here, you're going to see some even more updated words of mine. Aren't you ready? 
Who knows this one? Do you all know this one? No, okay. This is Mimus. Mimus was born here. Um, it's Mimus is the child of Natalie Gannon, who's a really wonderful everything researcher. Um, she's particularly known for this kind of interacting with robots kind of work. Like, can we interact with robots in ways that are more agentive or more interesting or more fun or more characterful or like all of these kinds of things we don't normally think of an ABB arm as being curious or sweet, right? Like what are the other kinds of modes of interaction that an industrial robot arm can do? It can do literally anything, right? Like, I mean, nah, technical things. It, it can do a lot of things and mostly we just have them building cars. Um, so this is interesting to me also, like with fabrication machines, right? Especially when we're thinking about interactive fabrication machines. Um, and I'm gonna show you my favorite interactive fabrication machine in the world, which is Blendy. Um, Blendy is a blender where to get it to blend, you have to growl at it. Growl at it, harder it blends. And I, just, like, I honestly don't think it's possible to improve on this, but we can all try. Um, <laughs> you, should, you should really, Please watch this video, it's on YouTube, it's very good. The YouTube commenters are so confused by it. it they're like, is she supposed to be sexy? I'm like, no, what, no, <laughs> like, no, she's not. Um, so it, it's, a, it's an experience. Um, but it's really, really simple, right? It's just a blender, you growl at it, 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 it growls back at you, and in doing so, it makes your smoothie. Um, and she talked about it, it was like, you know, I felt like maybe I needed to speak to it in its own language. It's a perfect project, I think. Um, so when I was in an HRI class in 2020, um, it's at home, right? So I needed to do an HRI project at home. Um, and I was like, well, I got one of these buddies. This is the robot I have in my house. Um, I have a lovely relationship with this buddy, right? I think many of you who've worked with one of these maybe do. 3D printer, it's a home 3D printer. It's, a very, it's the bottomest of the line 3D printer. Uh, it makes wonderful things for me, but also it's a jerk sometimes. Uh, and so I was like, let's try an interactive fabrication project on this. And let's think a little bit more about like, kind of funny or quirky or like characterful or whatever interactions one could have with it. Um, and so the specific domain I was thinking about was similar to that layer based embroidery product I showed you earlier. It's something where it's like, okay, the printer does a thing and then it needs a human to do a thing and then the printer's going to do another thing, et cetera, we're like trying to make. Um, there's a process that exists <laughs> in 3D printing where you can embed fabric in it. So you like let it print a couple layers, and then you like take a piece of fabric over it, and then it'll like print over that. And then you have your fabric actually pretty well embedded in the print. Of course, like I said, it's actually a collaborative process. Um, so it's like, oh, can we? That's a fun domain. Let's try to make that a little bit quirkier. Um, I, I want to be clear that this is not finished work. It's definitely not good finished work. It's it's a thing I tried once um, that I'm trying to inspire you with, because you can certainly do better. Um, and so I, um, this was also an excuse to interview a couple of friends and friends of friends of mine um, who are puppeteers or animators. And I was like, if you needed to get a 3D printer to tell somebody to do, you know, one of each of these tasks, like take a piece of fabric down or fold it in half or whatever, how would the printer convey? And um, you know they made me a bunch of really funny sketches, and I I made myself this little like blender module thing to like interpret these sketches into you know G code. So you have to imagine that this is the printer bed. Yeah, it's like hey 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 buddy hey buddy put a fabric on me. I don't know. I think it looks like it's saying that. Um, <laughs> and I ran a really bad like eight user study. Maybe nine maybe. It was a pandemic. It was coursework. I, you know, it happens. Um, and I, you know, I just like took all these little videos, and I'm like, what do you think the printer's trying to tell you? Tell me the weirdest thing you think the printer's trying to tell you. Um, and, I, and I did it for like a bunch of these kinds of steps, right? Of, of the various kinds of things one can do in all these um, projects. And, and, and of course, I want to be clear: the results were all over the map. Um, but it was interesting, and I think people were like, "Yeah, that seems kind of fun." I don't know. Maybe if it, maybe if it didn't suck, it'd be cool. Right? And it's, it's something to think about. Um, and like, oh, yeah, I had all these gestures. There was, some of them were much more obvious than others. So things that were like, put a piece of fabric here, which is like outline where it needed to go. Like, yeah, people was about that. The one that's like, take it now. I think people have our time. Um, but anyway, these people were all Philistines also because I also did a Likert rating question on Blendy, 
And apparently two of them didn't like it at all. So obviously not like it. Okay, that is the end of my talk basis. I mean, my goal here is like, hey, did you know this exists, right? Interactive fabrication with machines exists. You have these cool little machines. They're relatively straightforward to program. They do a fairly limited set of things, but that limited set of things is not so limited that you might not be able to think about, I don't know, maybe it does little gestures or something. Maybe it only does gestures that you understand, but that's okay. We're done. We're done here. Time for um, I think we have time for like one or two. One or two. Yeah, a few, a few. It is. It is. Oh yeah, yeah one fifty nine. Uh, I'm obviously. <laughs> right, talk. I talk. Talk. Uh, fire those questions at me. Do y'all have questions? <laughs> Where are you hey, man, are you trying to use any um, non-standard yarns with anything you're like clothing or knitting or embroidery? Yeah. Or so how non-standard do you mean? Because yes, like metal. that's technically wired, <laughs> but uh, not with the fanciest knitting machine because that's rude. Um, a little bit of the weaving with the um, the appreciably less fancy knitting machines, definitely weirder stuff. Um, as you know, I'm also in the Morgan Matter Lab, and so we have like. Liquid crystal elastomer yarns, like, I don't know, try that and see, see what happens. You know, not necessarily to a high degree of success. I have your ear D textile students generally don't think the interesting part is the materials. Personally, for, for myself personally, I'm often more interested in like the, the structures that come out or, you know, these, but I mean, that's not entirely true, right? Because like the solvent lace process where you're We'll talk here about it later, but it's like it is taking advantage of a, of a particular material property to do something that like nobody else would do. Uh, so yeah, materials. Materials are rad, but it's not like the first step of inquiry for me personally, usually. I have a question. If you're doing something weird in embroidery, put it in the bobbin. You probably already heard that. Jim, you look like you might have a question. <laughs> Jim always has a question. They're always hard. <laughs> there was something that was on my mind in the middle of the talk. Now I'm trying to recall it. I did also got you a question in my chat. That's oh, like, I will check that in specific. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, Leah, thank you, you so much for emailing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so to restart us, um, uh, we're actually going to have um, a short uh, kind of um, word from Golan Levin, the former director of the Studio for Creative Inquiry, about the writer. Hi everyone, um, it's really uh, a thrill to uh, be standing back up here and to see all your lovely faces uh, and to see this event uh, made into a reality. I wanted to. Um, uh, sort of partially welcome you because um, uh, the studio has wonderful new leadership and these folks are taking command in a wonderful way to kind of lead this workshop but but partially uh, the the seeds for this were set a while ago when um, I caused P embroider to happen um, so I was uh, professor I am professor of new media art here at Carnegie Mellon and I was the director of the studio before uh, Nika uh, Ross and uh, Harrison uh, Apple took over and uh, but um, the story was that I was, it was like Christmas of 2017 or 2018, and I was in Joanne Fabric purchasing random shit for another project. And uh, uh, I saw this, I think that's that's our machine. One of these machines is ours. I saw this machine over there and I was like, oh, you know, I've always kind of wanted a, a, an embroidery machine so I could, uh, you know, like send it, you know, stuff and do, as another way of, of making art happen out in the world. And I was beginning to think about like, how can I get generative art, you know, off the screen into the real world in a way that's more permanent. And so I saw this uh, embroidery machine and it was on sale. It was like a thousand bucks. I was like, that's actually like really good price for, for what all the teachers. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is amazing. Um, and so I asked the person, you know, um, what, what formats of data does it take? And I was thinking like SVG, you know, and she's like, oh no, it takes these custom formats. And I was like, oh, okay, well, um, 
you know, how much is the software to, you know, she's like, yeah, you have, to, you have to get special software. And I'm like, okay, is there, there's no free software. She's like, no, no, you have to buy special software. And I was like, well, how much is the software? And she's like, $3,000. And I was like, $3,000 for the software so that I can make designs sent to the embroidery machine. And she's like, yeah. And then I was like, um, really, there's no other options? She's like, oh, there's lots, lots of options. If you add an extra $400, then you can get text. <laughs> It was like that. It was like the basic option, the three thousand dollar option. You couldn't do typography, but if you added four hundred dollar, you get the text add-on package, and then you could get you could get like letters, shapes, letter shapes. And so I, I, you know, started to like look into this, and um, you know, like the software for these things. This is uh, you know, Designer Plus full version, eighteen hundred dollars. You know, Hatch Embroidery Digitizer. Oops, where you go? I, no, I cl oh no. Okay, I clicked. Okay, okay. I don't, I don't use Windows. Uh, you know, these softwares cost like, you know, what is this, $1,200 or $3,400? And it's like, this is insane. $3,000. You have to get They have layaway plans. Like, you could pay monthly, like, to get this kind of software. I was like, I'm going to destroy you people. <laughs> I, 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 she looked at me with a gas. She went, she like blood drain from her face. <laughs> I actually said that. I'm sorry. I, I actually said something like the effect. I'm like, I'm going to destroy this industry. And, uh, and, and so uh, thus was born the idea of um, making uh, it possible to, um, to, now there actually are other, there actually are open source software. There's a software called Inkscape, which is actually a plugin for, um, oh, sorry, St Ink Stitch. Ink, ink Stitch, which is a plugin for Inkscape. Um, the difference, though, uh, and so if you actually do get one of these machines, which you can get for as little as around six hundred dollars nowadays, a, a decent one, um, you actually can get free software to do this kind of stuff. And Inkscape, Inkscape with the Ink Stitch plugin does allow you to do this kind of. You can make a design, you can embroider, make a patch. The thing that didn't exist that I really wanted for my students was to be able for them to write simple kinds of generative code where they could sort of poop out images with like you know various kinds of like circles and things that they would that use specifically code to generate. And uh, so it's a different way of working, but if you work in new media art, then making generative art where you sort of write a few lines of code and it produces a, a design and you sort of hit a button, get a different design, hit a button, get a different design, hit a button, get a different design. I wanted to do that. And so processing has, uh, as you know, it's a really great, wonderful tool that I've been using for a long time teaching in the classroom to sort of like, uh, um, you know, write, write a few lines of code and get, you know, circles and shapes on the screen. It seemed like a wonderful library to extend to uh, to be able to write the formats for these kinds of machines. And those formats, we actually ported the code that exported the formats of these things from the Ink Stitch plugin. So those were ported from Python to Java. And so I hired, uh, at the time, two students. Uh, Tatiana was one of them, and Ling Dong Huang was the other, to kind of work as a team to develop the p Embroider um, plugin for processing. And so uh, uh, Tatiana was sort of, you know, pushing us forward on making sort of the, the demos that would sort of push the technology so we understood what we had to do, what we had to support, and sort of had all the knowledge about embroidery systems and what embroidery needed to do so that we could sort of inform the development of the software. And Lingdon was um, was working on porting the the sort of the, the file code, the, the file exporting code from um, uh, from Python to Java and also working on a bunch of really gnarly uh, computational geometry problems for producing parallel stitches and other kinds of things like that. So there's, some, there's even some computer vision in there to kind of understand basic shapes and things like that. So the, the Tatiana and Lingdon together basically produced PM Warrior. And um, that's the story of how it came to be. And I I'm really, um, I'm around this afternoon. And I'm really happy to help anyone um, sort of like with their code. If they like, if they're new, if you're new to programming, or if you're new to PM Writer or processing, I'm happy to to be here to kind of help you understand what you're looking at. Although I confess it's been a while since I touched it myself. Anyway, thanks. I just want to say hello and welcome you all, and uh, get things on the road here. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna jump into we're gonna jump into a few more games. Gonna, do you want to? Yeah. Oh, you're so right. <laughs> That's why I'm holding this. Uh, we're going to show some examples, and then we're going to finish up showing the demo on how to actually embroider the file that we made right before lunch. And then we're going to go through our little hatch prompt, and we're going to get started. All right. So this is our embroidery project slide. Um, 
and this has some of our work. So this is a project that I worked on called Tiny Overcoats, and it is a custom software that makes coats only for this little guy. <laughs> so I make um, ball jointed dolls out of polymer clay, and this only this one. See, it's too big for the other one. <laughs> um, gets a whole wardrobe out of generated. Uh, P embroider codes. So I have a generator. What I did was I made like a test pattern out of muslin that I then measured out in centimeters to get like the pixel value uh, that would fit onto this doll. And then I put it into, let me open it. It's all online and I have like a lot of pictures up here. Um, onto Glitch. It's in, so the generator is in P5JS and then that exports the image. The image I pull into P inverter and it generates the code pattern. And then you just sew it together. Um, it makes a pretty wide array of visuals. So you have this like fun puff sleeve coat, it does vests, it does longer vests, um, t shirts, waistcoats. Here he is. He's also actually on the table over there. So if you pop over, you can see these um, and you can see the different coats in real life. This one's my favorite coat. I really like the buttons. <laughs> and then, yeah, that's the pattern which I showed earlier. And here you can see what the pattern looks at, like stitched out and then you can cut out most of it. I use some fray check which, which stops the fabric from fraying and then I just sew these together instead of cutting that out. And I was kind of inspired by a project that I did in undergrad where I was taking the flat patterns for three-dimensional three shapes, bless you, and um, folding them up. So this is like a pyramid flat. This is a cube flat, which you can like fold up and it takes a 3D form. So I think that planted the idea of like making 3D things out of embroidery that you then assemble. Um, and I turn that into overcoats. Uh, so um, this was uh, a piece that I actually, I did this for as like a Lunar Gala alumni line um, last year. Um, and uh, it was kind of bringing together uh, like some uh, generative tools that I had built out as well as some really kind of interesting uh, samples that I've done towards um, kind of creating freestanding lace. Um, so and you can actually see this coat. It's like a full coat in the back here um, with this kind of vest piece underneath. Um, and it's a mix of computational and, um, and actually hand embroidery that all of the, the lines are chain stitching um, to kind of connect the, the machine stitched elements. Um, and then, uh, um, I, there's some other, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, so um, we uh, can just kind of, but yeah, um, so Leia's work and then um, going back to some of the work that Hugh, um, put together. Um, this is also a really lovely animation. This was actually funded. Um, this was a project uh, that L Lumi Garen worked on, um, and uh, we actually shared funding for. Oh, this doesn't have sound. Wait, can I? I I'm gonna can I remove it. <laughs> um, this it, it needs sound, so I'm gonna quickly. Um, yeah. Well, we need sound. Go ahead and plug in. Okay, go Sorry, I just wanted to actually sound for that video. Ooh. My laptop does not. See that? 
I just find it very calming. Um, but yeah, this was, uh, she was really kind of playing with texture and form and using freestanding lace to actually create um, some really kind of wonderful um, kind of kinet kinetic embroidered um, elements. Um, and this house is, is completely freestanding lace. So it was stitched on the water soluble fabric and then it was dissolved away. Further with kind of talking about freestanding lace, so this is Meredith Wolnow, which actually Leia referenced um, in, uh, in her presentation. Um, uh, Meredith Wolnow does uh, freestanding lace um, by, um, she actually, so she doesn't um, do kind of computer controlled um, embroidery, she does this all on a machine, but she moves the fabric under the machine uh, by hand. Um, and creates these really organic, very sculptural pieces um, uh, that are all, this is all just like uh, embroidery thread. Um, and all, um, I would recommend really like going through her work if you're interested in freestanding lace in this kind of, this form. Um, I actually have a book that, um, that kind of walks through some of her techniques and we have some samples that we actually did trying to kind of mimic some of her techniques. Um, and actually, there was discussion of embroidered zoetropes earlier. Um, this is actually um, some examples of uh, really kind of interesting embroidered zoetropes um, by Elliot Schultz. Um, Elliot is kind of, um, this is Theodore Gray. My understanding is um, some of the stitch fills that, yeah, um, the satin stitch in pea embroider was actually inspired by um, some of the uh, techniques that were used by this animator. And this is going to be a little loud, so I'm going to try. Yeah, uh, so this was also kind of a technical. I'm going to jump ahead because there's like a lot of. It's kind of fun. Um, I don't remember everybody watched this. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever watched this whole thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, uh, again, uh, some really kind of interesting kind of technical embroidered animation. Um, uh, this is also, um, I believe, yes, uh, actually, um, Jim was the first person who actually showed me this. Um, this is, let's see, that
much the full thing. But um, yeah, this is, this is all linked um, in the uh, um, in the deck. So if you want to go back, um, so this is actually a really impressive piece. Um, I, I wish I'd linked it a little bit better here, um, but um, actually, do you want to speak yeah. to it a little bit? Uh, oh. <laughs> Right, this is a, a giant embroidery. Can you zoom in? Um, I believe it's like 30 feet long. Uh, and it was hand embroidered. Um, it's an embroidery of the Wikipedia page for the Magna Carta by Cornelia Parker. And it is just, it's crazy. It's so big. By hand. Well, not okay. So it was like a lot of different people, but it was by hand. You can kind of see like that's like a paragraph section. You can see where like the fabric joins together. Yeah. <laughs> it's like let me find. It's like honestly, it's like thirty feet long. Yeah, you can find the Wikipedia page. Oh, we have a link in the yeah. tiny URL. Can they but... do it all at once, or like kind of take one at a time? Um, I think they. I think like. A different person did like each chunk, so it was kind of simultaneous, kind of not. Um, but it's got it's got an there's an um, another Wikipedia page for the embroidery and one for the Magna Carta, and it's also kind of funny because Wikipedia is like constantly edited, so this is just like like the page doesn't even look like that anymore. Um, it is 1.5 meters wide and nearly 13 meters long, um. which is 4.9 feet by 43 feet. It's also some notable names actually working on this. Yeah, kind of a crazy thing. And then the next project, I'm obsessed with this project. This is a embroidered 8-bit computer using like metallic thread and it's programmable and you can go in and make it do things. And it's so pretty. Um, does that link work? No, that's not a link. Um, yeah. Oh. No, there's nothing clickable. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was made by Irene Posh and Ebru Kerbuk, and it's Made of gold. What more could you want? And then that's the like the schematics. But if you look up at the go up two images, they like made it look all pretty instead of using straight lines. Um, it's beautiful. Do you want to talk about? This? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I mostly bring this one up uh, because um, there's a lot of really this is this is all hand embroidered I should note, um, but uh, this um, artist was actually someone who I've referenced a lot um, in terms of like st stitches that I've tried to develop. Um, so if you look at some of the some of the examples in the back, you might actually see um, like this kind of radial satin fill is something that I've actually worked a fair amount to kind of uh, create um, in some of the, the machine stitching. Um, and there's some kind of natural kind of nodding patterns um, and, and different types of stitches that I've worked um, to actually kind of emulate some of the textures. Um, but this is really like a, a she uh, works with such uh, like really wonderful texture and form. Um, and this is a case where I'm like, oh, it is really, really effective to use this kind of as inspiration um, and then uh, and try to try to kind of uh, create what you can um, on the machine. Um, and yeah, so. That um, is the, um, um, but yeah, so that's uh, kind of um, all of the examples we have. Um, again, um, I would recommend if you if y'all haven't, I, I know that people have been kind of moving around, um, but there's lots of examples in the back. A lot of the stuff that we just referenced in that deck is actually on that table right now. Um, and then, um, so we're going to start moving into kind of, uh, I'm going to demo how to run some of the files that we did earlier on the machine. Um, actually, first, um, I'm just going to show people how to access. I know there, there were some folks that did not like access like the examples folder. So I'm just going to show just some kind of like basic, um, uh, just like where to kind of grab some of the examples we were looking at earlier. Um, so 
I'm actually going to speed into this and probably show that. And then, and then I'm just going to show uh, how to run things on the machine. Okay, um, so uh, if I open processing, um, again, I just I just want to make sure that people have clarity. I know that people were a little bit confused and just like where to access all of the, the cool um, examples that Tatiana was opening this, this morning. Um, so if I open processing and then I go over to the examples folder, um, you can literally, so, and then I'm pretending that I just opened it for the first time. Um, if you go to the contributed library section, um, PM Writer should be under there. Um, so you'll see all of the, the different um, kind of, uh, the different examples that um, Taki was, was referring to this morning. Um, so it's just like, if you're, if you're kind of looking for a good starting point, all of these, you can open them and just run them and get, you can get an output, you know. Um, they're actually, this is how I kind of learned how to, how to use PM Writer, was just kind of running a lot of these sketches and just trying to kind of piece together code. Um, so now I'm going to jump into just showing y'all how to use the machine. So, um, like we explained earlier, we have the Husqvarna and we have the brother machines. Um, I, um, did you generate the VP3? Uh, or I guess. No, I don't have the button. Or you can. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, I, I just want to show them. Uh, you already do you want to show them? Do, do you already show how to kind of put the files on the flash drive and yeah. kind of start that process? Yeah. Um, I, I showed it earlier, but to put the files on the I showed it earlier, but to put the files on the flash drive, you just go into the folder where it got generated. I know a lot of you were looking at, like, that's the same file that the, in the same folder that like the PNG is and that the project is, and you just drag it onto your thumb drive, and then it'll show up when you uh, plug it into the machine. Um, I'm going to plug in the top drive. 
Um, and then you'll see kind of like a little USB symbol on the side. Um, and, um, so I'm loading the design. I'm, I'm also going to quickly show you actually on the doc cam how to keep those objects. So I'm just going to the design right now. Um, so. Um, okay, so one of the odd things about TeamWriter is that sometimes um, it does. Sorry. Um, sometimes it does not uh, render um, kind of, you can see like all these blank squares. Oh no. Um, they're not empty designs. Um, the, for some reason, PM Writer, it's one of one of the like bugs with it. Um, it doesn't render a visualization into uh, like this, this sub view. Um, you actually have to like pull up the design. Um, and again, if you, if you all are confused, we're, we're happy to kind of help you navigate these menus. Um, I usually, to be totally honest, um, we'll just put things into a folder that has a name on it, um, just so that it's a little bit easier to navigate, uh, like the USB, because blank tiles are, are hard to hard to figure out which one you want. Um, so what I just did um, was again, I'm just gonna kind of do that one 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 more time. Um, so you hit it, you hit set, um, and this is this is true for I think this is the same. Similar to the same process as you would use on the Lord machine, um, but you hit set, um, and then um, so this is the design that we want. If you want to see it closer, you can hit this kind of squiggly line. Let's see that. There we go. Okay. Oh, awesome! Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, the um, you kind of hit this squiggly line, kind of uh, embroidery hoop looking thing that actually just kind of pulls up a closer in view of it. Um, and then um, you hit edit end, that allows you to actually move it around in the hoop. Um, I don't have a hoop in yet, so um, but um, so yeah, so that pulls up the design. I'm actually going to quickly show you on the dot cam. So, so. Um, just how to hoop the fabric. Um, I have my hoop here. Okay, so um, an embroid every embroidery hoop has like, uh, or most embroidery hoops have two parts, um, an inner and an outer hoop. Um, um, I think there, oh, it's big here, actually. Those, those are fish. I'm just looking for the table. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, this uh, stabilizer that I'm going to use, so I, for, especially for muslin, because it's kind of a softer fabric, I always uh, use some kind of stabilizer. Um, uh, sometimes you can get away, um, like if you're using like a super heavy can, uh, fabric like canvas, um, there have been instances where I've, yeah, good. Uh, uh, there are instances where I've been able to get away without actually adding stabilizer on it, but we're just going to show kind of the full process. Um, so, um, there, there are a lot of pieces, so. Okay, so um, whenever you're hooping, um, I always put um, my stabilizer down first. Um, and this is like a probably a little bit too big, but um, it's, it's 
definitely better to go bigger than smaller. Um, and then we have really nice big pieces of fabric pre-cut by Harrison. Um, and you can actually see the outline of the, the lower frame. Um, and then, so, this is usually some kind of indicator or like an arrow kind of marking up. And if I look at the lower frame, there's also an arrow here. Um, but um, you want those, there's, there's always an indicator to kind of mark like what you want to be up. Um, so I'm going to make those two meet. Um, so I'm meeting the, the, the coop on the bottom. And then um, you can actually, so the bottom coop seems like it's a little tight. There's, there's a set screw here that you can loosen. So I can see that. Just a little bit. And then I have plenty of fabric, so I'm just going to go for it again. Um, and then you're, you're pretty much true. Um, I usually tighten down that, that screw again just to make sure, um, especially for, for certain designs, you really don't want things to move around at all. Um, so you, you really just want to make sure and you can even kind of pull out at the edge a little bit. Just make sure everything's really nice and tight. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, if you're working with a linen, you'll probably want to honestly pre-iron it um, just to make sure that you have a really nice and flat surface. That you're stitching onto. Um, and then okay. Um, perfect. Um, okay, so now I'm going to put the hoop in. So you want to make sure the foot is up. Um, so anyone? Yeah, I'm gonna the foot up, there's like a lever. Yeah, there's always a lever somewhere in the back and that's the barn has a little bit different. Um, but it's like this lever right here. Um so on the brother. Um on this large machine, but T obviously you, you can indicate it. I don't believe you have to like raise or lower foot. Yeah. Okay, um, so we're going to raise the foot. And we'll have this put it in. Um, again, this machine is pre threaded. It's a, a white bottom thread and a gray top thread. Um, and then um, I'm going to go back to the menu. The touch menu. I'm going to hit edit end. Um, and uh, you can see, so um, the, the interface is showing uh, kind of the center of the line of center. If I wanted to move it up, I can. Um, the fit, like other things, you can actually add additional designs into the hoop, like in this interface. Um, we're just going to kind of drop it there. Um, and then, um, so now it's in kind of embroidery mode. So if I lower the foot, um, you can actually see this is going to go to green, um, and it's actually going to allow me to start to So, the am going to take a button. Here. Sorry. <laughs>
you can answer this right now, but I'm just trying to get through. I know the temporary restrictions have like automatic features that will actually cut that travel there. Also realizing I wasn't speaking into the mic, but um, yeah, so if you look over here, you can also see that um, the machine will estimate, give you a time estimate. It's not always super accurate, but um, it's a good kind of general indicator as to like, oh, I can walk around, walk away for a few minutes, or um, I need to come back for. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, in a second, I'm going to move to the Heskavarna um, just to kind of give you guys a quick rundown on how to use that machine because um, that's the other type of machine we have in the studio today. Um, Tati is just grabbing the USB um, and it's going to load the files onto that as well. So I'm actually going to start to get the, I'm going to actually show you all the, the like slight difference in the hoop um, from the, the brother to the Husqvarna. Um, so uh, this is the Husqvarna machine, looks a little bit different. Um, it's definitely more effective than the brothers. Um, and uh, um, it's uh, actually, this one is not too threaded. Um, if we can just have a bob, and I know it has black thread in it. Bob will look good. Um, so uh, we'll kind of quickly go into materials that we have available, um, but we have a lot of like pre-wound bobbins um, if for some reason any of the machines are running out. All right, so this finished stitching, you can see it says finished embroidering. So you're just going to press OK. And do you press? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, so the needle's already up, and then you just detach the hoop. And then you can pull it out. And there it is. I'm going to leave it in the hoop so that we can embroider more stuff on this. But if you're done, you can just take it out of the hoop um, and it's embroidered. Yeah. That's the purlin fill on the circle and then the tangent line stroke on the rectangle from the demo that we did right before lunch.
Some quick notes about the difference between like the Husqvarna hoop and the Brother hoop. Um, this actually has like a quick release um, that will actually allow you to uh, kind of um, open the hoop a little bit more easily. Um, so again, that's um, and it also has a slightly different mechanism that allows it to attach to the um, uh, to the machine itself. Just a muscle. Uh, okay, so again, removing that top piece off to the side. Um, and the stabilizer. Um, this is definitely, as you can, this is also like a bigger hoop. Um, so you can do a slightly larger design. Um, Um, so also maybe a good indicator is that um, the text should always be up whenever you're actually looking at it in the proper direction that the text is upside down. Uh, and then uh, the Husqvarna, I guess the arrows for kind of like indicating what should match up. Um, there's an arrow there and then there's an arrow on the inside. And then, if that seems too tight, you can kind of loosen that a little bit. Um, and then I'm gonna take it back. Um, and like I said, the Hesperana has like slightly different mechanisms or slightly different things to do. So with this one, it just kind of slots in instead of um, the brother. You kind of put it in through the top, right? So it also it's a little more finicky about the order that you do stuff. Um, so when you turn it on, it should have the hoop not in, and then it's going to be like. Oh. All right. Yeah. So um, you just press OK back then, and then now you can put the hoop in. 
and it's going to show the USB contents. So we're going to go down to uh, workshop demo. And then it's a bit finicky about making sure you have the right um, hoop size. So if you look down here, when you're actually looking at the hoop, it says 240x180, and up here it says 80 times 80 or 80 by 80. So if you press, if you try to do anything, it's going to like yell at you. You have to go in and change it um, and make sure you mark the one that you have in. It can tell what size it's got in. Uh, so now it should be good to go. And then you lower the presser foot. You press start, and it starts. What was that? Oh, that was you pausing it. All right. Um, and from here, it's like the same. You just watch it go. And we'll, we'll be walking around so we can um, help you out if it's having issues. And this one doesn't tell you the time estimate, but it does tell you the stitch count for the current color that you're on. Um, and it tells you, so we have one of two is what it says on right next to that spool graphic. And then underneath is the stitch count of the total stitches for that color, since we're doing a two color on this one, um, with the stroke being a different color than the fill, even though we embroidered it as the same color. And when it's done, it says change color, and it always, yeah, that's the RGB value. Sometimes it makes stuff up for the color name. <laughs> but yeah, and then you just start it again. And then cut thread in. Sometimes it's not long enough, so it's fine. Like that one already disappeared. And I'm going to start again. And then, yeah, and then you just wait until it's done. Okay, y'all. So, um, like we talked about, so um, the goal that uh, is like by the end of the day, um, for, for our goal is to do like some custom patches. Um, so I'm just going to quickly walk you through maybe some tools and techniques. Um, I know that there's been like a lot of that already, but just like some kind of pragmatic things that we we'll might be able to do today. Um, and I'll give like specific notes uh, and some interesting things in particular, um, just like those specific techniques. Um, and then, um, and then we'll just kind of jump into some more hands on work. So. Um, no, okay, broken link. Well, can't worry. I always just find out how much that. Thank you. 